so um, good to see you all. Sorry we got snowed out last time. Um, and uh, so we have two meetings left. So today we have some more testimony. Uh, and uh, we also have a, a draft report and our comments that we all have chipped in in previous meetings and um, sort of a form to work through. Uh, a, an item that we've been discussing is a possible priority or recommendation, pros and cons associated with that, and notes to capture. So we'll, we'll work through that and uh, after we do the testimony, and then we'll, that'll put us in a good position to um, have a revised draft um, for our final meeting in a week. So, any procedural or we have two questions? Okay, all right, so let's jump in. I'd like to invite first uh, Adam Peer to join us at the table. Just to jump right into it? Yes, please. The floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Adam Peer. I'm a senior director for packaging at the American Chemistry Council. Uh, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about uh, what ACC is doing on recycling, uh, some policy suggestions. But most of all, I'm here to be a resource uh, for all of you as you uh, put together your report and you make your recommendations and uh, suggestions uh, to the state and to the legislature. Um, so if there's something that I can't answer here, I'd be happy to, to research it for you and to get that information back to you. Great, thanks. Um, so one of the things that ACC members, and especially in the plastic division, really value is looking at being a leader and a champion on litter reduction and prevention, waste minimization, and recycling programs. One of the programs that we, uh, that we actually champion and start is called the RAP program, which is the RAP Recycling Action Program, that looks to recycle uh, film uh, through a retail collection uh, program. And we've uh, partnered with US EPA, the Sustainable Packaging uh, Coalition, and several states to implement that sort of program um, to collect things like plastic bags, plastic films, things like dry cleaning bags, uh, bags that, for example, like food would come in. Uh, to collect those back at retailers and to recycle those into uh, products such as durable outdoor lumber for decks and fences as well as new packaging material. We also sponsored several projects in the Northeast including uh, several Save the Bay uh, cleanup projects, litter reduction projects, including uh, Green Up in Day in Vermont as well as working with the Northeast Recycling <coughs> Council. Uh, our members also participate in programs like Operation Clean Sweep, which help, um, helps plastic makers, shippers, and users of plastic pellets contain and prevent them from entering into the oceans and waterways. We're one of the founding partners of the Recycling Partnership, who I understand uh, testified before your group uh, at an earlier meeting. Uh, and they're a national no um, recycling nonprofit group that works uh, to improve um, uh, recycling uh, at curbside. And we're also founding partner and sponsor of Keep America Beautiful's I Want to Be Recycled campaign. Uh, we're also a supporter of the Closed Loop Ocean uh, Fund, which looks to reduce the amount of uh, waste that goes into our oceans. And we're also a member of the Ocean Conservatives Trash-Free Seas Alliance with the goal of advancing scientific rigor as we examine things like marine debris and exploring solutions to increase public understanding and awareness of the issues. One of the things uh, most recently, a little earlier this year, that our members participated in is the launch to, uh, of the organization, the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, uh, which is a new nonprofit organization that's, that has committed over one and a half billion dollars over five years to help end plastic waste in the environment. Um, our members uh, have made a circularity economy uh, commitment uh, to where we want to see 100% of plastic packaging reused, recycled, and recovered by 2040, as well as 100% of plastic packaging that actually is recycled or recovered by 2030. In terms of um, policy considerations that I hope that the committee would take a look at is really to try to think of and reframe, I think, recycling and the issue from something that's solely an environmental issue but also think of it as an economic development issue and a landfill diversion issue. Um, recycled items can be very valuable feedstock uh, for industries to be turned into either new, um, new products or re be repurposed and reused. And I would think about asking your own commerce department or your economic develop 
department to look at the waste stream and the recycling stream that Vermont has and try to identify what are the industries that make sense to use this as good feedstock. I'd also consider asking the uh, committee to take a look at if further developing a recycling center, like the way Washington State just established a recycling center that actually looks to um, actually be a market maker and line up uh, recycled products, uh, recycled content with the products that they can go into to see if that's something that makes sense for the state. I'd also consider partnering directly with the uh, American Chemistry Council to see if a return to retailer type program makes sense. One of the things that we're working, for example, with the New Hampshire Grocers Association is relaunching that program in New Hampshire. Lastly, I'd also consider asking the committee to look at recycling technology investment, things like infrastructure investment, things like foam grants that are offered by folks that make uh, foam products. And I was also looking at are there demonstration projects that would provide the data that's needed um, so that you know where to target uh, re um, uh, recycling infrastructure. Other things that the state could consider doing is creating better recognition programs um, for public and private purchasers of items with re recycled content. I'd also ask the committee to take a look at uh, their procurement laws. <coughs> Are public buyers uh, encouraged or incentivized to use products with, um, with uh, recycled content? Um, I'd also look at the types of waste, um, waste studies and recycling studies that your state already conducts to make sure that they're sufficient and are giving you the types of information that you need to make uh, good decisions. Um, also, and this is something that I know all states and communities struggle with, is the effort to get more and more uniform recycling guidelines. Consumer education and consumer participation is a very large part of what makes recycling um, successful, and it's very hard to do that when different communities have different types of recycling guidelines. And so I'd look at it to see if there's all, if there's ways that that can be improved, and to ask stakeholders to work together. And lastly, um, there's no easy answers. If there was an easy answer, we wouldn't have groups like this together. Um, so I'd ask the group to continue engaging with industry and other stakeholders in this conversation. Um, my members, plastic makers, really want to work hard on this problem. We need your feedback and your dialogue. So I just ask the group to continue that dialogue so that we can help find the right answers for your community and nationwide. So with that, those are the remarks I have, and I understand that uh, you have some, um, some written remarks that I put together for the group. Happy to answer any questions or if there's um, things that you'd like more information on, I'd be happy to research that and bring it back to the group. Thank you. Um, any committee questions? Yeah. Mr. McCullough. Thanks for coming today. You bet. I bet you weren't just around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have family that. up here. <laughs> Good. Um, my questions are around film mm -hmm. plastic. Uh, currently, um, Certain larger grocery chains are taking film plastic back, if you will, um, and instead of deadheading trucks, they go back somewhere. Um, is there so? There's several questions around this. Is there an East Coast Central place where plastic, film plastic goes? Uh, what happens to it after it it, it gets? At the end of the line, where that that truck that brings groceries in the other direction, what what happens to it then? Where does it all go? How's it collected? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, when film uh, comes back like that, and you you described it absolutely right, it's it's deadheaded back on empty trucks back to distribution point, and then it's usually collected by a buyer there, and typically they turn it either into uh, plastic lumber, like durable outdoor lumber. Uh, or there's more buyers that are interested in turning those back into plastic bags um, that get reused by the, the retailers that um, um, collected the, the film to begin with. And is that process on the East Coast, for instance, or mm -hmm. okay? Um, the quality of, of, of that, of, of the kinds of film plastic that are being collected now, so we recognize we have Poor quality, um, 
stuff in our blue bins that uh, recollect uh, it's not film yeah. um, and higher quality uh, when they're, <coughs> they're deposit what's the quality level low medium high of, of that plastic uh, so film uh, there's there's really sort of two categories I'd put it in so it's the back of the house film so when you think of when you get like a big uh, pallet of something um, Typically, that's wrapped in. Drink wrap. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, that stuff, when it gets put together in bale, is going to be really high quality because there's really nothing, nothing else in it. Um, when other things are collected, like for the stuff that's for the individual packaging, for example, things that consumers bring yep. back, there's a greater chance that they're going to mix something else in there that they shouldn't. Okay. And, and so they bring different prices on the market, likely. Um, it would de it would depend on how end use. Yeah, it, it depends Lumber on the end or, use. Yeah, yeah, because if, if you're trying to make uh, plastic bags out of it or film or yep. uh, I keep saying plastic bags, but yep. it could be like dry clinging sure. film. Uh, it really depends on what they're using it right. for. Right. Uh, Lumber, it's a little lower spec, so there can be a little yep. bit more contamination. Yep. And and um, finally, we're becoming. Vermonters are becoming increasingly concerned with agricultural plastics and the issue there is they're just dirty yeah. and, and uh, with, with dirt, eh? <laughs> but also with silage leachate and, 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 and other, other contaminants. How is that being handled or who, is anybody handling that on the East Coast? Well, right now, agriculture recycling, it's tough, precisely yep. because of what you what you mentioned. One of the things that uh, we're hopeful for, though, is things like advanced recycling, like molecular recycling, will be able to take um, items like that that have contamination, like dirt and other things that you'd find like an agricultural setting, and be able to process them in a way that turns them back into a monomer that can go back into all sorts of products. But that is a challenge, and that's something that, that in part we're working on. One of the things that I think would be great if, if the demonstration projects um, come about correctly is uh, to be able to take you know things like that and putting them into like asphalt or landscaping products or things like that where you don't have either human contact or food contact because you have to have that really, really high, pure, um, you know, low contaminant because you don't want those things in there. Thank you. Yeah. May I? Um, so you're perhaps jumping in the middle of this discussion, so I just wanted to back, and we've had a little bit of a break, so just yes. to help me, and one of my faults is I kind of set the table, even when it doesn't need to be set, um, which is a good analogy right after things. <laughs> so three issues that this group has been looking at are um, a significant portion of the MSW, Vermonters Dispose, are single-use products, about a third. And of that third, about half of it could be recycled. We have a recycling system that is super stressed out. Um, taxpayers and Vermonters have invested in 30 years into the infrastructure that we have. Private sector works on, has made investments, and then they charge um, for the use of those um, services. Um, but with the change in markets that we've had, our MRF tipping fees are exceeding our landfill fees, and we have among probably the highest landfill tipping fees. Mm -hmm. So you cannot expect Vermonters to continue to pay more to recycle more materials that might be marketed, you like you're saying, more and more of your products will be recyclable. This system, Vermonters are already stressed out. They can't take more into this recycling system. Something has to change to our recycling system. And then the third issue is that we have human health and environmental impacts from some of these single-use products. So we've got three big issues. And the list that I just heard you state, you know, wait till 2040 to get some of these materials more recyclable. That's a long wait. And then ask the state to do a number of things. My question, that's a long one to question too, <laughs> what is industry willing to do to help us across the state, maybe across the nation, with these three issues? So the first thing that I would really look at and examine would be 
what are the ways that the state can encourage demand? So what are the ways that the state can encourage both public and private buyers? I'm not buyers? asking not the state. What, are, what is industry willing to do to help with those three issues? Like I said, creating demand is in part how this issue is going to get solved. Um, and the state is uniquely positioned uh, to, through either uh, recognition or changes in the procurement laws, to be able to help create some of that demand. The other thing that I think that um, I think is, is sometimes overlooked is that it can be a feedstock for uh, industry to create new products um, or reuse products. And that's something that I think the state's uniquely positioned to play a role as sort of the moderator to help bring those folks and those sorts of conversations together. And one state that I particularly liked, I think it does it pretty well, is, is South Carolina. Uh, they're a state that um, really knows the type of recycled content that they have in their state and actually goes out and actively recruits what are the industries that could use this as a feedstock to turn into new products. Ultimately, you know, in many respects, it's a demand question. If there was the demand, uh, greater demand for uh, recycled content, then it would pull through on the prices and it would pull through on the different sort of costs. So you're advocating the state take the lead in all I think what I've uh, what I've talked about are the things that would actually create the demand that would help close the loop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> so can you following up on that a little bit? Can you uh, comment on who's using post consumer waste uh, requirements in a way that you see as effective, perhaps a model for Vermont in terms of driving uh, any kind of change here here. And I'm just, there's always a scale question, too. You mentioned, for instance, Washington State. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, Vermont's relatively small, so I'm wondering about the scalability of that kind of approach. Yeah, so I would look at um, the EPA's green guides are a good place to start. Um, so they're both buying guides that could easily be modeled as, you know, this is something that you could turn into uh, uh, you know, a pure pyramid guide as well, too. Um, the sort of trick to do uh, to do it though is a lot of times there isn't sufficient supply to meet demand, which is one of the things actually one of the Washington State reports makes note of. So it makes sure that it was, it's weighted in sort of like a point system mm -hmm. so that you're giving preference, but you're not saying like we'll only buy it if it has X percentage. That sort of thing. Um, and then more broadly on the economic development point mm -hmm. you were making, I mean, uh, how you, where's a, what's a particularly good example of a state, a smaller state, that was able to implement a program that was, um, had the kind of environmental, public health um, benefits that we're driving towards, and also had a positive economic impact? Again, South Carolina is going to be about the best example. And this is something that's also emerging, like a lot, not a lot of uh, states are really looking at it this way, and it's something we're hoping to encourage more states to look at it. Um, the, your remarks really focus on, seem to focus primarily on recycling as being the solution. Mm -hmm. And I, Recycling is critical, increasing those rates is important, um, but it's not really going to be sufficient to address some of the challenges that Kathy alluded to. And so I'm interested to know what industry um, is proposing with respect to actual um, volumetric reduction of some of these materials um, and also addressing some of the toxicity with respect to single-use food packaging in particular. Um, that is not really included in any of your remarks, and I think that's a critical part of the solution, those two aspects. Sure. So I agree with looking at the issues in terms of waste diversion, so how do you keep things out of uh, landfill. And as soon as you remember when I read the reports that were presented to this committee, um, the majority of what goes into a landfill is things that I would like, closely examine because um, 
like when you do things like you know when you visit MRFs and when you visit, uh, for example, like landfills, and you actually look at uh, what's going into those. A lot of times, the plastic is not the majority of what's going in there. And so I would look at what are the other things and how can they be better recycled? How can you take them out of that? And what are things that you can do to help reduce the contamination? Because one of the things that uh, bolsters um, recycling is having a good, high quality supply. This is one of the things that, like, for example, one of the uh, Washington State reports that's a part of the work cited uh, uh, list that I gave you is that when supply and virgin resin prices were at parity or close to parity, one of the issues was there wasn't reliable or high quality supply in order to meet uh, the demands of feedstock and be able to turn it into new, project, uh, to new products. So that's one of the things that I think the state as, you know, sort of a form of all the different stakeholders can look at and work at. Um, I think in terms of like, you know, health issues, one of the things, and I'm assuming you're talking about like food service? I, I think that's one of the areas of concern is single-use food packaging. Sure. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, any food service has to go through is it has to be approved by the FDA to have that food contact or has to go through process in order to go th to be used for either hu human contact or food contact. And that's something that our members take very seriously and we work very closely with the FDA to make sure that we're meeting those requirements. I just a follow up, you know, I, I didn't, I, the response is really focusing on recycling. I didn't hear a uh, industry plan around reducing the volume of these materials. So, um, and then the other, you know, I think that the, the concern is that we've, it's been, we've seen time and again that the FDA regulations are not sufficient and that, you know, we're, they're not addressing emerging contaminants that have the ability to cause harm. And so what is industry doing to get out ahead so, of those challenges? <clears throat> yeah, so let me address the, um, the, sort of the, the reduction part of it. Is we fully subscribe to the EPA's reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, we think that that is the, the appropriate way to look at policy. One of the groups that we work with is a sustainable packaging coalition. And one of the things that they have put a greater emphasis on is working with groups like packaging engineers to understand two things, how they can design packaging and consumer products that use um, less resources in terms of either volume, uh, material, how you can pack it smarter, those sorts of things. Um, and we also work with groups like uh, the American, uh, or the Association of Plastic Recyclers that puts out education to talk about when you're designing um, plastic packaging or consumer product, what are the attributes and qualities that it needs so that when it goes to a recycling facility, it'll actually be collected and sorted and will come out into a bale that has low contaminant. So those are the two groups that we work with to directly address the recyclability of, of items, as well as how can it be, you know, quite frankly, designed a lot smarter. And I guess the other question, the other part of that question was just what is industry doing to get out ahead of emerging contaminants that we know are causing human health impacts. So our, so it's a, a little bit different section that I work with uh, at ACC, but they monitor and watch like the different reports that we've seen that come out with like the World Health Organization and some of the mm -hmm. EU and the UN reports that have come out and we're following the science and we're following what those folks are saying about it. And a lot of what would came out about like those particular reports was that more study needs to be done to understand what the true impacts are, and that's something that we'll participate in. Does the council recommend or take any sort of, uh, I guess, a, a prudent cautionary uh, approach on any of these emerging contaminants? For instance, we had um, some testimony um, related to PFAS, and Vermont has a standard that's uh, significantly stricter than the 
federal standard, but we also had testimony about how if you're looking not so much at carcinogenicity, but at um, endocrine disruption, that Vermont's levels may be um, uh, orders of magnitude too high in terms of those kinds of negative health impacts. And so as we discover, um, as testing starts showing people being impacted at lower and lower levels, um, the law can be relatively conservative in catching up, but meanwhile there's a window of time where people are exposed at those higher levels. And we're looking at, in Vermont, at trying to reduce those kind of exposures. I'm wondering if you can comment on uh, doing anything that's ever in ex uh, exceedance of an FDA floor or an EPA floor uh, <coughs> levels allowed. Um, my expertise is more in recycling and circularity, so it's going to be a little outside of uh, my area. But I'm happy to visit with my colleagues to get more information to the committee on this, on that particular topic. Okay. Um, oh, um, can I just ask you what the industry's mm -hmm. position is on extended producer responsibility or a similar model to managed packaging? Um, <laughs> We would want to, if there's a particular proposal that you have in mind, because EPR can mean a lot of things. There's a lot of models out yeah, there. Yeah, and, and you had some very good presentation that sort of broke out the hierarchy of, of what it looks like. So it's going to really depend on like what specific one that you're looking at. So some of the tenets that we're going to look at is um, we would want to see any sort of uh, fee system or fee scheme that puts in that... Um, contributions are, that are made go back into bolstering recycling, um, that they actually follow like science and evidence in terms of like what will address uh, recycling for a particular area. Um, and then the other things that we would look for is like it's something that's material neutral, so it's not picking one material over the other, and it's, it's looking at things like life, total life cycle assessments in order to make informed decisions. Um, uh, speaking of total life cycle assessments, do you have um, data on that? I know that what someone means by total is somewhat subjective, and we've been talking about trying to make sure that our window of examination is broad enough so that we're um, not making apparently good choices that have left out maybe a cost or externality. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I have a couple of different uh, citations that are actually um, in the uh, testimony that I okay. gave. Uh, one of them is the True Cost study and the other one's a Franklin study that will give you a picture of what uh, the environmental impacts of plastic packaging <coughs> and steel products are compared to other materials and, and other packaging types. Um, I, I did see the testimony where they talked about um, you know, sort of the limitations of, of life cycle assessments. And um, I guess the comment that it would have in response would have to that is um, when you were looking at a life cycle assessment, you're trying to compare one material or other, you really do have to look at what are the objective measures between the two. Some of the things that was talked about in terms of, well, it didn't take into account you know, X, Y, and Z, those are very hard things to measure and are going to be very situational. So what that impact is going to be in one area, like one geographic area, is going to be very different than another because a lot of it, a lot of times it depends on, like especially when it comes to litter, like where was the product used, was there a place to dispose of it, you know, what's the particular culture of the area, and those are things that are very difficult to measure and apply like on a national basis. Any other uh, questions from the committee? Thanks very much for coming in. Absolutely. And I'll get that information to, uh, to the committee assistant to get into this. And if we have more questions, we'll pass them along to you. You know how to get a hold of them. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, rescheduling. <laughs> no, thank you for no, thank you for being flexible with, with my schedule. It's much obliged. So um, let me preface by saying that I do have written testimony here. Um, and however, I know my limitations, and if I try to read my written testimony, you will notice. 
<laughs> so, but the fact that I'm not going to read it word for word doesn't mean that it's not of value. As a matter of fact, I reread it and it's much more cogent than I would have thought I could have pulled off. So <laughs> please, please do read it because my sense is my uh, verbal skills today may be challenged. So my name is Christopher Loris. I'm the general manager of Foley Distributing in Rutland, Vermont. And Foley Distributing is not to be confused with Foley Services, where people see a lot of trucks running around doing uh, linen service. Foley Distributing is a full service, family owned, local, it's qualified as Jan Sand in the business, janitorial, sanitation supply with a healthy dose of food service items thrown in that we distribute uh, throughout Vermont, as well as parts of New Hampshire, um, Massachusetts, and New York. And while there are no industry trade groups in Vermont, specifically, who are comprised of, uh, of distributors, um, I can assure you, based on my conversations with others at one conference I was at, as well as talking to our competitors and our customers alike, that what I'll testify to is most likely going to be um, agreed with by most folks who are food service distributors in, in serving the state of Vermont. Can I inter sorry to interrupt. Yes, absolutely. Quick question. When you say food service products, so what, is, what are examples? Um, frankly, I, I think uh, if you were to look to the bill that created this working group, yep. that's what we're talking about. So we're talking, we distribute uh, <laughs> for the next six or seven months anyway, foam cups, yeah. um, foam clamshells, plastic um, plastic food containers, mm -hmm. which would be considered single use, whether it's peak number one, <coughs> number six polystyrene clear, or expanded number six. Likewise, a lot of compostables, and uh, as an aside, this is where I won't be speaking for the industry, Foley's recognize our niche as probably towards the Vermont model being more environmentally friendly. So we push a lot of compostables and we push a lot of number one P. Um, so we, uh, compostables based on, you know, sugar cane, corn starch, uh, plastic, bamboo, and many models of anything you would buy in a convenience store is probably the best way to think about it, especially those full service convenience stores that offer food uh, ready-made to be taken out. And that's what I've qualified as food service products, as as large as, let's say, pizza boxes. Okay, thanks. So thank you for that. And I'm sure I left a lot of categories out, but um, I'm hardly a subject matter expert since I've been with, the, been with the company for only a year. So my testimony today will focus on three key areas of interest to the working group. Um, First will be an overview of the somewhat complex system of distribution and redistribution of food service items going from the manufacturer through a distributor and finally to the end user because there's something else thrown in there that I'll discuss a later called a redistributor which makes it extremely complex especially as you consider expanded um, EPR, expanded producer responsibility. Number two, how the changes within the industry, especially in the last year, year and a half, uh, in the global marketplace impact the supply chain, and specifically how industry-related public policy um, affects product availability for the state of Vermont, because that works into the product that comes into our waste stream, the changes that are happening at other states. Something that the, the uh, General Assembly worked on last year by example is the disposable plastic bags at checkout that is being replicated as you well know from your testimony last year um, in municipality after municipality and state after state and it's creating a supply challenge for paper bags and I'll get into that a little bit later on and why bring that up. And thirdly, uh, I'm going to address the potential impacts of extended producer responsibility on food service product distributors and our business operations. And the word there is potential. So within the industry, the statutory definition of single-use product is broad enough to encompass not only 
plastics and foam, but also reasonably include plant-based and plastic-like compostable cups, food containers, flatware, as well as disposable plant-based cups, whether that's, as I said before, wood pulp created from trees or from sugar cane and increasingly bamboo and, uh, and cornstarch. There are dozens of manufacturers for these items that feed the single-use product industry and sometimes the product is shipped directly from the manufacturer to the distributor and then by the pallet load, truck load, and we in turn will warehouse that and send it directly to the end user. Likewise, there are times where we will receive that same item that we would normally get from a manufacturer by truck load or pallet load directly from the manufacturer from something called a redistributor. They, Reedies, that's the term Reedy, is they buy large quantities of single-use items by the truckload or pallet load. They warehouse them, and they generally send them to distributors as we're trying to fill the gaps in our ordering patterns um, or if it's something we can't buy by the pallet load and need to just buy uh, half a dozen cases or so, we get them from the redistributor. So that complicates the, the process a little bit. Um, and again, you know, as far as whether we qualify as end users or our customers, that encompasses, uh, um, this is where I would try to read it, uh, industrial users such as schools, a lot of kids, um, colleges, hospitals especially, uh, are a large, large user of, of industrial, or not industrial, but of single use food service items. Um, You've got the other end, food trucks, small cafes, and in between a lot of convenience stores and uh, industrial manufacturing plants that have a lot of employees. So the, the customers that distributors like Foley's would serve, and in this area that also includes big players like W.B. Mason, uh, Swish, Red River Paper, that used to be a local company, and um, even the folks who like Capital Candy, who buy a lot of their product from redistributors, sell it in turn to the end user. So I already talked about the complicating factor of the redistributor. Let me go into that a little bit more so you understand the supply chain because that impacts your decision-making process on where you could potentially put the administrative requirements uh, if you go with an EPR. So as I said, there are a number of products that Foley's and other distributors buy directly from the manufacturer, sometimes by the, mandated by the truck load, sometimes by the half truck load, sometimes by one or two pallets or by weight. We receive those items, as I warehouse it, and then we track through our computer software where they go. There is no industry standard for the computer software that's used by distributors, so it's be very difficult to create a system uh, as a plug and play to assess, measure, and determine and track where those single use cases started with the manufacturer and where they finally ended up with the end user. As I said, complicated by the fact that there are redistributors. We could have a num an entire pallet we buy from the manufacturer that we track directly to the end user. Or if we're running short, we could buy that same item from a redistributor and the question would be who it would be responsible for tracking that item. Would it be the manufacturer that sent to that redistributor who would be in, in our case out of either New Jersey or out of New York or out of Connecticut or out of Mass. And when we receive it, we could send it directly to the end user, but there are some cases, there are other distributors who we sell to as well, um, who could receive that case that could have come from either manufacturer or re-D, come to us and goes to another distributor that ends up at an end user at that point. So there are a lot of touch points if we're trying to track that item that could complicate EPR, and I'll address that a little bit. And uh, as far as the supply chain also, I have to touch on, lastly in today's technologically driven world, 
the end users may not only purchase items that they would otherwise receive from a traditional distributor like Foley's or Swiss Right River or W. Mason, but instead purchase it online from Amazon or another online retailer. We've had a number of our end users call up our customer service folks or say to our salesmen, we want bamboo flatware. There's a, let's just say there's a co-op locally who wanted flatware made out of bamboo last spring. The only place we could get that to redistribute to them was the same, was the same um, seller who they could buy from Amazon. So as the marketplace changes and product requirements change, there are end users who will purchase things online that are covered under the the products that you're working on here today and uh, that as i said complicates the distribution network holistic distribution network uh even more so likewise as i wrote here there are distributors like wb mason that work with redistributors and will drop ship items where wb doesn't even touch it where they could purchase an item, a, an end user in the state of Vermont, a food truck, could purchase an item or items from WB Mason, and WB Mason would work with a distributor, and that would be drop shipped directly from out of state where WB wouldn't even touch the item, and it may, you know, that it would simply appear on their books as a pass through. So it's a, I came, you know, in a previous life from the world of cigarette candy grocer distributors where things are very cut and dry, and I was blown away by the complexity, if you will, of the distribution network for, uh, for food service items and for the janitorial world. It really is not a problem for us to manage unless tracking and uh, reporting comes into play, which is a very real potential under EPR. And that, that's a world I played in uh, in the cigarette and tobacco industry, and it was relatively easy to track. For this industry, tracking items from manufacturer to end user would be extremely complex. And I share that simply as a reality, not to dissuade you from doing the right thing, not to dissuade you from um, you know, pursuing environmentally friendly strategies, because that needs to be done which is you know, why our sales force is pushing that type of product, but you just need to be made aware that it is, can be a very, very complex process um, for the distributor and, frankly, for the entire supply chain from the manufacturer to the end user to manage. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, please. So, um, does Foley also have out-of-state clients? We do. Okay. We do. So um, here's an example. We do have uh, a number of convenience stores we sell to that have a presence both in Vermont and New Hampshire. And when the foam ban goes into effect for coffee cups in the state of Vermont on July 1st, if we have anything left over for that specific um, that specific convenience store, we'll ship it over to New Hampshire. And uh, But that is not the case for, for all the product, obviously. We also have a, a convenience store chain we work with that is wholly in the state of Vermont, and they've already transitioned all their cups to paper um, and started that last summer because they wanted to get ahead of it. So, so thank you for offering that because I can't remember if I spoke to that in my, in my written testimony that, sure, we bring in things by the trailer load, and there's no telling when we get that one pallet of 60 cases uh, where they're going to end up. And I do have a matrix made up that I failed to bring with me, and I apologize for that, that demonstrates the what it, where a single product could go, whether it goes into Vermont or Vermont, New Hampshire, or Vermont, New York, or Vermont and Mass and New York. And there's any manner that we would have to try to uh, track. 
And then the flip side, you have competitors who are not Vermont based who are also supplying them. Oh yes, uh, that's that's absolutely true. As a matter of fact, most of I, I would say Vermont fully distributing is the only Vermont based distributor. Swiss Right River would argue that um, when they were just White River Paper out of Hartford White River Junction area. That was a fact that they were bought by not just an out-of-state company, but a multinational out of Canada. So there are distributors that can complicate and disrupt the chain. One thing that I did not mention that I should have spoken to is uh, the fact that there are a lot of small restaurants that it's in their interest to buy their single-use packaging, their to-go containers, not even from a, a distributor that I mentioned, they get them directly from their food providers. The best example that we can all wrap our heads around are small pizza shops. Very hard to find one who is buying their pizza boxes from someone other than who they buy their cheese. Likewise, Oriental restaurants, all the little full packs, they get those from the same folks they get their food products from many times small food distributors out of the Boston or New York area. So are those, you know, are those distributors who are really focused on food and not distributing product, are they even going to be aware of any changes in the system? Very possibly not. Well, so obviously you've given thought to both like the, the, regula the regulation and reporting yes. and stuff like that. So um, it's are, have you reached any conclusions? It sounds like the, the only sure point of regulation is at the end user because there's going to be so many ways things could, so many potential sources of product going to that end user that it could be difficult to regulate at the distributor, redistributor, or other food uh, service supplier level. Agreed. And the, but at the same time, I mean also, when, when I, in a previous life, when I was a, a wholesaler, we also had a retail shop, recognize that there are competitive situations where the end user, the customer, the mom and pop on the street, some of them are going to play by the rules, and they're the ones that are normally punished, and there are some who don't play by the rules, and it can put the folks who are playing by the rules at a, at a competitive disadvantage, and that's unfortunate. There's, there's no easy answers. My, and I'm here to tell you that the challenges that, that there could be. Um, I do need to share, and it would, it would be improper for me not to share with the committee, especially because it's in my testimony. Um, the distributors do, however, we do currently track many items that we sell because we have to get in the industry rebates from the manufacturer for price contracts associated with the products we sell. And um, we have a full-time contracts administrator on staff and that is necessary for any distributor who serves, whether it's janitor supplies, sanitation supplies, paper, you know, toilet tissue in bulk, um, hand towels, hand soap you see in any in any washroom, that uh, we have a full-time person on staff who manages the rebates and tracks those contracts. So you may find the manufacturers uh, saying, pointing to the distributor saying, they do it already anyway, but it's not as easy as pushing buttons. We did an analysis, and I testified to that here, that it would probably, for the food service items, with the analysis we conducted, would probably be a 0.75 FTE, so 0.75 full, full-time employee, 28 to 30 hours a week to manage the number of hours that one of our employees would have to put into tracking this. And even if that's done, there's no guarantee that if we uh, track that item, report it to the state so the state gets its funds it needs to build out 
the single the, the single use infrastructure, whether it's recycling or composting, and don't forget about composting, please. Um, we would then report that, if you will, potentially under an EPR model that I was looking at, back to the manufacturer for a bill back or a rebate. But I can tell you that the data sets, the requirements by each manufacturer are different. And um, it does, it would take a lot of work, and there is no guarantee that the distributor would receive full reimbursement from the manufacturer. They're kicking things out all the time right now that we have to eat that cost when rebates uh, have a zip code that's bad or if we don't provide the proof in the right format to the manufacturer. And it, you know, that, and that, that leads to the point of who's going to do the reconciliation for the state. There's got to be a regulator, and I get that, in order to, to receive the money the state needs to build out the system. Um, can I ask Mike O'Grady to weigh in on, um, we have, we have a, several laws in place that are extended producer responsibility, and the definition that is utilized, and I think all of those laws would probably not be pointing to fully distributing okay. as a producer. And I think that the Canadian um, EPR programs also are looking um, <coughs> further up the chain than mm -hmm. at the distribution level within the province. Um, so that that's my first thought about this concern. Which, and you might remember, there is that hierarchy of manufacturer who sells into the state, and then there is no manufacturer that sells in, the distributor that distributes in the state, the importer if there's no manufacturer or distributor present, etc. So, to say that Foley would never be, I, I don't know if I could say that. It's possible that they could, especially if they're especially if they're distributing a cup for someone with a brand on it. Remember that one? Right. Uh, that, I think, that's a possibility. If Foley distributing has that brand, if, right. if Foley has their own brand, brand they right. would then become right. the manufacturer, right? Yeah. Or if they were purchasing directly from overseas uh, and there was no middle there's no entity, right, distributor then that would right. impact yeah. you. But, uh, you know, I don't know whether that is the case with fully distributing. Yeah, I, no, we don't have anything that we consider to be the manufacturer of, but I know there are some distributors who, who do do that. Okay. Um, an example is uh, one of the redistributors we buy from because there's been a challenge with getting plain white single wall paper cups yeah. um, due again to the, the changing marketplace. And there's a redistributor we buy from who manufactures those themselves. So we can either buy the one that they manufacture or we can try to get a plain white hot cup that, they, that we could get direct from manufacturer or that they would redistribute to us. So I can tell you that though Foley's doesn't manufacture our own cups, there are those who would be considered distributors into the state of Vermont that do. Right, and under their brand. Under their brand, So yes. they would have to, under an EPR program, um, estimate their sales into the state, and that's done different ways by different manufacturers based on either population and total sales or or another or actual sales into the state where they can show that. Understood. You know, you know the the reason I share things is as I, and I have to reiterate. Um, you know, we the mission of our company is to be that environmentally friendly company that focuses on environmentally friendly products for our, for our customers. And um, consequently, we want to be part of any solution that the state is developing to address the challenges that I've heard in previous testimony with respect to the waste stream and how things are ending up in the landfills. 
especially, you know, it's hard for me when I'm on the phone with somebody or one of my sales folks to push somebody or write down that we'll, we'll send you that case compostable uh, food bowls knowing that that's going to end up in the Coventry landfill because there isn't the capacity in that service area of the state. And sometimes the end user are doing it for the really right reasons because they think that composted product is going to end up in a compost facility. And sometimes they're doing it just so they can put a sign on the wall, we use compostable products. But uh, we want to be part of the solution. Jim and then Ken. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris, everybody in this building benefits every time you've been in here through the years. Thanks again. Um, so I'm, I, I'm being a little naive, I think, but when I'm thinking EPR, the P is for producer. Yes. It's not for redistributor or distributor. And, and so, um, and, and we just touched on this a little bit about who is a producer. <laughs> and, and so am I, am I, so in, in a world of producer responsibility, such as, when gasoline or fuel mm -hmm. comes into the state, not every mom and pop or not every uh, truck that brings it around to our homes reports all of that. That that taxing is done, taxing if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, as it comes into the state on a you know per unit basis. Now, understood. That's pretty s overly simplified versus the maybe thousands of products we're talking about and maybe hundreds of producers. Um, but um, taking you out of the loop and putting it in on the, res the producer's responsibility, um, I can see still working. Um, the producer of the clamshell, the producer of, of the, of the uh, flatware, what have you. I, I think I can also see you as you, as uh, David Dean would say, the corporate you, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, as, as a re distributor actually um, um, on your way back <laughs> from where you're distributing, picking up products that are going to go back um, to the stewardship group location. Um, so I, I'm kind of wondering um, if this isn't, wouldn't be actually a uh, economic benefit for redistributors and distributors. And, and um, so that's, that, that is a question. And do you see the thought that it would be the producer's responsibility versus yours or the um, uh, uh, other, the uh, reproducers or The redistributor, yeah, I understand. Redistributor, right. And it's a fair question, and, you know, as you said, Mr. Representative, sometimes I've, I, I have been around this building a number of times, and as I was talking to Mike earlier today, commas scare me, um, so I know how they can be used. <laughs> we were talking about proofreading this thing. So what, bless you, what got my attention in the bill was, I believe it might be under the definition of extended producer responsibility. I think it calls out the word distributor specifically, and that kind of scared me. Um, so that's, that's why I'm focusing so much on that, mm -hmm. is because I recognize that under the definition in the law, the producer, frankly, could be defined as the distributor. And I know maybe it's semantics, but I know that's what we do. And it maybe it's not the definition of distributor under the law, but I know that distributor was, was noted there. As far as the um, being an economic opportunity, I can't dispute that. As a matter of fact, Foley's had tried it before I arrived, codenamed John King, um, with picking up bales of plastic 
trying to work with Casella when it was considered a commodity, and unfortunately it's no longer a commodity, but I need to get your card because we do, though we don't pick it up from the media, from our end users, we've got a boat ton of foil that we, we have to dispose of, and right now, unfortunately, it goes to Coventry. And if we can figure out some way to get those bales in his stream, um, we want to do that. So yeah, if, if, if there's not economic opportunities now, Mr. Representative, I believe there very well could be in the future, and we need to be part of that. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Sure, please. So, After that, we have, I think, time for one more. We have a next witness on hold. But. It's just going back to your question, Representative. My understanding is that if, if a Foley or a Foley competitor orders product from, say, Canada, if they import product from Canada, they are considered the producer, right? So they're not just the distributor, as we're discussing in the bill, but they're also a producer if they order from the country. Depends on if the seller, the Canadian company, has any presence in, this, in the Vermont. Right. I was going to say with our, oh, this is what I was going to add, yes. our electronics um, EPR program is yeah. we try to go, it's like a tree. It's very complicated, like you said. They just, you know, think about like a computer coming in the state, like yeah. a name computer. You can buy it like many different ways and online. But we try to go back as far back in the tree with that definition as we can to the manufacturer. That way you have the least number of entities that you're trying to track. Um, so like with Dell, you go back to Dell. You don't get to every distributor Along or wholesaler or big box store or Amazon or wherever. Fair enough. You try to go back. So, um, so Michael's right though. So, you know, it's how you how we would craft that de definition and how far back on the tree you can go. And a distribution system is um, sufficient right. presence. So if that Canadian company is trucking it in mm -hmm. for distribution in Vermont, right. that is sufficient presence. Yeah. We have a number of even Chinese computer manufacturers that are part of our electronics system, uh, e-waste program, that mm -hmm. we hold accountable. Um, and with that, uh, we don't try to track all the sales. Uh, we just do, we prorate it on Vermont's population, we're two-tenths of one percent of the U.S. population. So we say, what is your national sales? And we use that. Okay. And rather than trying to do all the complicated tracking and math and whatnot. Um, Understood. Right. Understood. I appreciate that. And uh, as I said, and I do apologize then to the working group for focusing no, so much on that piece. It's good stuff. <laughs> it's good stuff. How these materials flow. Yeah. That's yes. really important yeah. to us. Mm -hmm. Like I said, and, uh, what I do need to say, and my, my, my most senior sales rep would have hit me in the head if I didn't say it out loud, is that, and I'm going to reiterate because I said it once before, please do not forget about compostables in this because the, uh, it's clear that there is a defined policy of the state of Vermont going forward with respect to composting. And uh, some, some items are on a slow track and some are on a fast track, but we need to make sure that those, if those are considered single-use food items, they're not forgotten in the chain and that infrastructure does need to be built up. Can I just add to that because it's a huge, huge, huge issue not only the infrastructure, but um, we've worked closely with Foley Distributing on compostables because there's so many brands out there claiming so many things, mm -hmm. and there's no policy for consistency in what either the public, the dis the, they've been caught with purchasing a lot of material and distributing it under the pretense that it's compostable and it's not. So nationally, there's work being done on that, but I think you know the state of Washington or the city of uh, Seattle uh, passed an ordinance that won't allow, uh, will, will require only certain things that can be claimed compostable, and, and it's very clear. And as we move on towards the implementation of the food scrap diversion requirements, this is going to be an enormous issue, and it's a big problem for CSWD because we are the one one of the only facilities in the state 
that will accept compostable um, food service ware, and we get an awful lot of contamination because of the claims of the other materials. And Dave says hi. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Um, any other quick last question? Right. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming thank you, in. Sir. Appreciate yeah. it. And th thanks again for your patience in uh, waiting for my schedule to allow me to show. Okay. Hi, is this Abigail? Hi, yes, this is Abigail. Can Hi. you all hear me all right? Yes. So uh, this is Chris Bray, and you're on speakerphone in a room <laughs> with 25 people or so, and uh, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you. I've always wanted to be a disembodied voice. <laughs> My name is Abigail Stein. I'm the Director of Government Affairs, speaking on behalf of the American Forest and Paper Association. Um, the forest products industry accounts for approximately 4% of the total U.S. manufacturing GDP, manufacturing nearly $300 billion in products annually, and employs about 950,000 men and women. Um, in Vermont, the industry employs nearly more than 4,500 individuals with an annual payroll of nearly 151 million, and the estimated state and local taxes paid by the forest products industry total 14 million annually. The American Forest and Paper Association serves to advance a sustainable U.S. pulp, paper, packaging, tissue, and wood products manufacturing industry through our fact-based public policy and marketplace advocacy. Um, our member companies make products essential for everyday life from renewable and recyclable resources, and we're committed to continuous improvement through the industry's sustainability initiative, Better Practices, Better Planet 2020. Um, we have the, uh, I have a slide of um, our goals, our six sustainability goals, including our goal of achieving a 70% recovery rate. Um, obviously, 2020 is fast approaching, and we're currently working on our 2030 sustainability goals, which we hope to roll out by third quarter of next year. The paper and paper-based packaging industry's commitment to maximizing recovery of its products for recycling is real and long-standing. In 1990, the recovery rate was a little, it was around one-third, um, as you can see on the screen, about 33.5% of the paper consumed in the United States. Um, as of 2018, thanks to voluntary industry initiatives and the millions of Americans who recycle at home, work, and school every day, that recovery rate has um, doubled to 68.1%. 96% of the U.S. population had access to community curbside or drop-off paper recycling services, according to our most recent survey of communities. And according to the EPA, um, more paper by weight is recovered for recycling from municipal solid waste streams than glass, plastic, steel, and aluminum combined. So paper recovery has fostered a well-developed and dynamic marketplace that allows recovered fiber to find its highest value and use in manufacturing new products. That, in turn, helps encourage more recycling, which is part of the reason why paper is one of the most recycled materials in the U.S. today. Um, and this is through a collection commitment by many parties, um, and those are listed on the screen. Um, so a misperception of many of the single-use products that are identified in Act 69 is that their life ends with the consumer dropping the product in a trash can, but it doesn't have to end that way. Our members are working to change the end of life for many of our products, um, and some of those are already in effect. Um, a study of the uses of food service packaging, most specifically recovered for recycling, was completed in 2018, and our research search documented the industry's capability to use paper-based food service packaging to manufacture new products and found that food service packaging is being used to manufacture recycled container boards, recycled paper board, de-inked market pulp, free sheet paper, and away from home tissue. An important aspect of any effort towards sustainability is promoting the existing community programs. We believe engaging the community should come together with engaging manufacturers and industry experts in discussions on further increasing recovery. Um, we appreciate the state's goals of decreasing the impact of single-use products on the environment and on the resources, but we do have concerns um, that the working group um, efforts to create an EPR program um, in order to achieve those objectives may not achieve the goals. 
Eventually, the practical ceiling for the recovery of paper and paper-based packaging for the purpose of recycling will be achieved, um, and to impose an EPR scheme um, in hopes of marginal gain could actually be cost prohibitive and to the detriment of the success we have achieved. Consistently high recovery rates, a well-established infrastructure already in place to collect and process paper products, and the industry's ongoing efforts to increase voluntary recovery make mandates like EPR on paper and paper-based packaging unnecessary. Creating a state-administered board to control the flow of materials subject to an EPR program could disrupt the dynamic, complex, and efficient markets for recovered fiber, potentially even resulting in less fiber recovered for recycling, and introduce substantial additional administrative costs that would eventually be paid by consumers or taxpayers. So instead, we want to talk about some of the best practices that we have um, seen uh, move towards um, improvements in recovery. We support the continued continued development and promotion of best practices and leveraging existing investment. Widespread adoption of best practices, including efficient collection systems and optimized processing infrastructure, effective education and communications, and appropriate support mechanisms can contribute greatly to the recovery success that's sought. Where there's already a well-developed infrastructure for collecting paper and paper-based packaging, um, Vermont has the opportunity to seek to increase con consumer education to drive increased participation across the entire supply chain. chain. One resource for consumer education is A's and K's own Paper Recycle Set Word website, which is dedicated to promoting increased recovery of paper and paper-based packaging at work, school, and home. It includes educational resources to show consumers what's recyclable and how to recycle properly. Um, on the website, we even have um, more specific ones like recycling in the kitchen, recycling in the bathroom, things like that to help people be thinking about where they, what they can be recycling that maybe is being missed. Additionally, ASMK and K is an inaugural founder of the Recycling Partnership, which creates public-private partnerships that build community recycling infrastructure and provide technical assistance and resources to increase consumer participation. The partnership recently launched a free online resource entitled DIY Signs that any recycling program can use to help educate their own consumers about what goes in recycling them. Um, so this is getting into more detail on some of the best practices. Um, taking steps towards eliminating contamination is another important step. Um, ASMPA has long been an advocate for um, sticking to dual stream as opposed to single stream collection as contamination of paper products is one of the leading reasons why recovered fiber might not be accepted in facilities that would otherwise um, purchase those materials. And, um, you know, communication in order to improve consumer recycling behaviors. Um, in addition to the recycling partnership, we've also been working with Remade Institute um, on research um, to look at what is increasing contamination in single stream recycling and identify opportunities through collection and sorting methods that can decrease contamination. Another um, aspect is supporting capital investments and improving the infrastructure of our recycling system. Um, these are some of the programs that are already um, some of our members are looking into or have already invested in um, as a way of supporting um, continued improvement, um, both in eliminating contamination, but also being able to use more of what is collected towards the purpose that it's um, set to. Um, and these are not cheap um, investments that they're making, and they're um, the kinds of projects that um, having to pay into an EPR program would potentially um, redirect funding from and um, potentially eliminate those kinds of projects that are continuing to improve ways of using the product and improving the products themselves. At a minimum, these best practices should be implemented before any consideration is given to approaches. Um, such as EPR that would disrupt the solid recovery foundation Vermont communities and their private sector partners, partners have already built. And there are already some pretty excellent um, tools in action in Vermont, which I have up on the slide. I assume you all are very familiar with these, so I won't belabor it. Um, but I am personally a big fan of the Recycle Like You Live Here videos um, that show what does and does not belong in the recycling stream because, again, contamination is huge for. Um, the paper and paper-based packaging um, industry, 
Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for clear and usable tools. Paper can be a model for our recycling performance. The paper and paper-based packaging industry has set and met our goals established on a voluntary basis and publicly reported on our performance. Um, we remain open to working with others in the private and public sectors to maximize paper recovery, and we believe that governments can help support this market success by avoiding mandates and um, arbitrary rules that could disrupt the current recovery system. We believe that the responsibility for materials recovery has to be shared across the entire supply chain and include consumers in that process. The paper industry is doing its part by meeting or exceeding our voluntary recovery goals for our products, and we urge you to consider promoting increased participation in community recycling programs and some of the other best practices I mentioned. This project and future legislation um, will be based on policy to the benefit of the environment and best practices for doing business in the state. And I'll just wrap by saying thank you all for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions and you know we want to always be a resource as you all shape policy um, on this important issue. And my contact information is on that last slide. Great. Uh, thank you very much. So this is Chris Bray again. I have just a couple quick questions from your the slides. Um, you sure. were in the terms of the percentage of paper that was getting recycled, I think it said for a decade it's been 63% or better. Um, mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's, is it been relatively flat for a decade? And uh, I'm just, you know, you, you doubled the rate, but I'm just wondering if we've reached a plateau. Right, well, and that's, that kind of gets into what I mentioned um, a few slides later, which is that we are rapidly approaching the ceiling for um, paper recovery. Um, you know, when you think of paper, people often think, think of the more obvious recyclable materials, you know, your office paper, your um, boxes, your cups. Um, but paper also includes um, wallboard paper, that includes books. That includes um, certain things that we consider the yuck factor. Like you don't necessarily want used toilet paper or facial tissues in your recycling stream. Um, so there is a ceiling, and we are approaching that. Um, our setting the 70% goal has a lot to do with what we believe is the ceiling. Although with some of the new technology we've explored. Um, the uh, that number might be able to creep up some. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say it's a plateau so much as the low-hanging fruit, the easiest get has been gotten. And now it's, it's really, we, we have regular meetings with our recovered fiber sector members in order to discuss best practices and ways we can eke out those next bits. But there are, um, you know, some of our biggest barriers are frankly ones that are outside of our control, um, things like multifamily housing and how difficult it can be to collect there, um, you know, areas where it's difficult to um, implement programs because of distance and that sort of thing. And can you say something about volume? Uh, I don't know if, I don't know this world enough to know whether you're seeing increasing volumes year by year or what that trend line looks like. Um, you know, I think, frankly, our recovery rate is one that's based on um, the, the amount of paper that's produced in a year, and then um, we, we take that in, in, as the denominator and the numerator is based on what number DTA um, has, has for what is collected for recovery, and so generally that um, based on both of those, so the denominator is generally based on sales. And so I don't have a number on volume for you. I can talk to my colleagues and get back to you if that would be helpful. Okay. And my last quick question is the role of post-consumer waste requirements. Has, has that been a helpful thing in any uh, case in terms of uh, creating a reliable, steady market for recycled fiber? Or has that, it is, been, uh, that is a great question and one that uh, I um, should have brought up in the first place, so thank you for asking. 
Um, so post-consumer um, content requirements um, is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, our industry, in particular, the recovered fiber folks, are always trying to make sure that um, whatever fiber that they've collected is being put towards the highest value and use product. So if, you know, uh, whatever fiber they've collected for um, making into recycled content product is, um, you know, the highest value one is cardboard boxes, and that's where they would like to send it. If it's currently, um, you know, maybe uh, furniture particle board, then that's where they want to send it. And so in situations where there's legislation um, that requires that that recovered fiber content is sent to a particular product that may not be the highest value, then in some cases that can actually create a financial hardship for my members as opposed to a benefit. It is appreciated that there, you know, is to a certain extent a, a I wouldn't say like a guaranteed market, but that there is value in that. Um, but it, it also sometimes can mean that the fiber that they've collected is being forced into products because otherwise they can't tell that product at all, but then they have to use more expensive materials potentially for um, products that um, may, may actually lead to a higher um, value ultimately. And when you say value, I mean, are you saying that the uh, return on investment? Yeah, okay, so ROI value, okay, great. Yeah. Um, other questions from the committee? Hello, Abigail. I'm Representative Jim McCullough. Um, thanks for, for helping us today. Could you tell me, um, I know you can, would you tell me um, how many, not, how, a, how many members um, the uh, American Forest and Paper Association has? That's one question, then if, I'll have a follow up on that. Sure. Um, you know, we have a couple of different brackets of membership, but I would say we have around 50 or 60 um, member companies that are in some form or another uh, paper products or paper-based packaging producers. Um, and, I'm, and I'm thinking you just answered my second question um, about how they're broken out. Uh, so you've got 50 or 60 um, producer members. Um, do you have non-producer members? Um, I'm, pres I'm presuming people in the forest industry are not members. Um, so that's kind of a two-part question. All right, well, so, you know, that kind of depends on the company structure. There are companies that are, um, you might say, fully vertically integrated, and so yep, they own yep, land, yep. they do logging, they do the full thing, they do the converting and the sales. Yep. There are some that are just in one or a couple of those um, stages in the process. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, this is Kathy Jameson in Vermont DEC. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we would be interested, or I would be interested, to see any data that you have, because uh, one of your slides, if I understood it correctly, said that EPR could actually result with less paper recycling. And so do you have data to support that from uh, a province or, or country or somewhere where they've implemented EPR? Um, you know, there are only so many programs that have EPR and um, so I think more what that speaks to is the concern that um, an EPR program, um, most of the ones that exist and the ones that is sort of um, broadly laid out in the language of, of Act 59 um, would require um, financial investments of a substantial nature by the producers. Um, and recyclers of paper products. And so the concern is that current investments that are being made um, in recycling, in collecting, and the budgets that are geared towards that um, have the potential to need to be redirected towards EPR, um, to, towards um, 
participating in this program. And so that's, that's a part of the program, um, part of the concern for us. Um, I will talk to um, my colleagues and see if they have any specific examples that they might be able to give you. Just so you know, our experience with the EPR programs that we have implemented in Vermont is that they have dramatically increased the collection rate of the material that's being targeted. Um, Sure, and I mean, we can certainly see that being the case, particularly in a program that um, may not be um, already structured um, at a successful level um, or at like a high recovery rate when the program is started. But when we're already at 68.1% recovery rate, um, you know, the, some of that um, gain. Um, we've already achieved. Right. So I'm glad you recognize we have a re high recovery rate. We've worked hard in Vermont to establish our recycling programs and let people know about them mm -hmm. and make it convenient. Um, all the recipe that people say you need to have a successful program, but right now we are financially struggling with our recycling system. As you know, the markets have dramatically changed. 40% of the materials from our MRFs are mixed paper, fiber. And the market for fibers is upside down. People, you know, MRFs used to get paid for fiber, now they are paying for fiber. So right now, our system needs financial assistance to shore it up, or unfortunately, it could lapse and we won't have that high recovery rate. So I, I'm curious what industry is willing to do to help us financially shore up our recycling system. Yeah, um, so I mean, a part of that is we are extremely aware of that. You know, we're, some of our members are, are part of, of that, and, you know, group is being very concerned, and, you know, that's one of the difficulties of being in association with that kind of rather broad um, membership base is that these com conversations within our membership can get a little complicated. However, I will tell you that um, even in the last year and a half, almost two years, I guess, since um, you know, there's been some major changes in the recovered fiber market for mixed paper in particular. There have been um, quite a few facilities that have come online that are targeting specifically taking in mixed paper um, and um, increasing capacity in order to take advantage of this, um, you know, recovered fiber um, materials that are available on the market that are currently at a very low price but have the potential to be, um, you know, repurposed and used within the country where as they used to um, be shipped overseas. And so, you know, a lot of, you know, and especially, it's, you know, it sounds like, I know that you are very familiar with how the recovered fiber markets work. Um, to a certain extent, it's what's needed is time in order to allow them to adjust. Um, but, you know, our members are making investments in order to, um, you know, take more of the recovered fiber in, in recognition of what's changing. And I think we're on the same page with needing to find ways of working together with states and municipalities, and that's why we work with folks like the Recovered Partnership or their segment partnership in order to um, find ways of helping with um, this this difficult um, market situation we're in right now. Is it ever um, cheaper to start with, uh, you know, virgin materials rather than recycled materials to create products? For paper, um, that's a complicated question and it depends on the market. ASMK isn't in the um, market prediction um, realm of the industry and so that's not something mm -hmm. that I am comfortable getting into um, but I think that um, you know there's there's the potential that that um, the case for many different products at times I just I cannot speak to now or any other time because I'm a I work in government affairs so I'm not allowed to talk about this part of things <laughs> okay um, any other questions from the committee well, great. Uh, thank you for your help today. And if we have any follow-up questions, we'll um, get back to you by email. Terrific. Thank you all so much again for your time. Thank you. Two meetings back, I'd ask people to pause and um, 
list suggestions for um, material to continue to work. So as, a, as an aid to memory, we have hard copies for everyone of all of the suggestions we individually um, put in. Thank you. And here's the copies of the draft report. So Thank you. the plan is to take, uh, to go to pause for a moment and have people look through their suggestions and then we have um, this form which I thought might be helpful to us in terms of just going through the items that were suggested, uh, listing them, putting in some pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses, whatever we're going to call them about undertaking that approach. And then a, a little notes field in terms of, uh, you know, for me it was things to keep in mind. Like we we know that we have partial information. Uh, there may be concerns or questions that we want to stick into a note field, something like that. And I thought in this way we could sort of do our homework together and look through the, the items that will go into the appendix section in terms of what are the expectations of how that gets used. So we're not drafting legislation as a group based on it, and we don't, uh, we're not going to end up voting on them like you know, seven of uh, 11 said, yes, do this. Or, but um, so we're not doing votes for each thing. We're going to list them with strengths, weaknesses, notes on them. When we come back together next week, I think uh, it would be helpful, I think, to the 180 legislators who are going to end up you know, using this work product or this working group. Um, if we tried to rank them in terms of opportunities, like here's, if you are going to, if you have limited time, which the legislature always does, here are the areas where we think you would most profitably start your work, knowing full well, even at our first meeting, that there's work to be done beyond just this one legislative session coming. I think it will be helpful to start thinking about what's a long-term approach. How might it be over multiple years, multiple phases? How do we make some progress this coming session and acknowledge that there's more work to do after that coming session? So, so why don't we spend five minutes, uh, if people just want to reread all the contributions of the group, and and then we'll start going through them and um, doing the pros and cons. Question: um, Looking at our recommendations for inclusion, the item column, item one, two, where 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 are those items? Are they such a, in in the report with the big labeled blue one? Two, where are they? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just took a bite of this. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we should be eating in a meeting. I meant things from these lists. So that's any one of these things could be in a oh, Okay. I since see. on yours, yeah. you might say this is three items. Okay. Good. Yeah. And people, there was a, a fair amount of overlap between people's individual right. recommendations. So mm -hmm. we'll end up accumulating a list. Okay, good. And Mike Front is going to take them and put them up on the screen as we go so that people can chime in. <clears throat> we'll create a composite document as we work our way through. Thank you. Just a, this is Andy. Just a question on, um, I note in the draft report there's a recommendation section and you said we're not going to be voting. Are we supposed to note concerns with certain approaches via the con section, or how how um, are we to articulate where there might not be agreement? Uh, thanks, Andy. Yeah, so that um, the concerns, I suppose, could either show up as cons on that pro-con column. Um, they could also show up as notes. So um, uh, that would be two places if you had a concern about an item that we were talking about to put in that, for us to um, record that. Does that make sense? Yeah, now, obviously since I'm on the phone, I can't see the pro con column, but I'll imagine it's wonderful and, and try to try to make one. It, it is. Why <laughs> <laughs> the <in> church? <laughs> about ready? Okay. 
So, uh, might as well just go front to back in our collection of suggestions. And um, I think we'll just take them all as they come up. And let's start working our way through and see how we're doing timing-wise. And we'll sort of pace ourselves in terms of the depth of each thing. So, um, Jim's is uh, sheet number one. Uh, so we would, for item, I think we just put in band single use plastic, eating utensils, plates, and bowls. I don't know if you have a copy of this one. Yeah. Okay. Keep them all up as we work our way through front to back. It'd be great if you could increase the cost. <laughs> yeah. Just across the board. Um, we can we can add you know pros cons notes as we go. Um, honestly, since we're doing this as a sort of homework as a group thing, I don't know how our timing will go. But I figure we'll start doing it and we'll figure out how much depth we want to get into as we work our way through. Um, so do you? But you're the author. Do you want to say anything about pros cons notes? Um. I guess, I guess, uh, no, no, I think those, I think that'll probably become evident in discussion and, and maybe for purposes of just getting this out here, yep. um, uh, I would, I would just stick with, with, with this, although since I did my established EPR for film plastics, um, um and the uh, EPR for uh, what is essentially um, the, the beverage industry, um, plastic and glass. Uh, we, as a group, we've discovered a bunch of other EPR things uh, that, that would, would be included. So EPR for film plastics uh, would probably also be glass and plastic containers. It would also be um, uh, other kinds of, of paper products, for instance, as we were just getting discussion today. But, so, um, I think uh, I, I, I think probably I would welcome the groups, pros and cons, and notes as we as we move forward. And I want to make sure everyone else is able this opportunity as well. So, Jen, yeah. you're, you're the recipient of, so for, if we start with plastic eating utensils <coughs> and bowls plates, um, do you want uh, to weigh in? I mean, anyone can, but I'm just thinking it is the recipient of all these uh, things. Right, and I think that was, um, I was just trying to tally some of the similar recommendations. Mm -hmm. And that was another recommendation, or somebody else's recommendation as well. And I think that, um, you know, I'm not sure what the cons would be at the top of my yep. head. The pros would certainly be um, the alternatives would be Okay. which would be beneficial for our infrastructure systems for food waste diversion. And I think, Kathy, you had something in about not having mm -hmm. uh, plastics or single-use products <coughs> that are potentially toxic in the environment and that are apt to become litter. Correct. Are these that an example of that? These are, um, but if we also want to tag on the potential human health impacts, could we modify, add to the ban to also include any food packaging that contains PFAS? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, and, and with respect to banning all of the um, the foodware, I mean, would would we allow for an option that you know the compostable is com you know that'll degrade under high heat and temperature. It, and I don't know if there's a product out there that would degrade under natural environmental conditions mm -hmm. um, that would not result with plastics in the environment. But it, it, that could motivate the industry to go toward that. Direction. Well, I I don't think it I don't think that um, it would result in plastics in the environment if it were compostable, truly compostable, mm -hmm. right? So even if it ended up as litter you're not resulting in microplastics in the environment. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an excellent point. That becomes in the definition of the composite. That does. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Part Which, of the uh, we, we would need to have. Right. Yeah. Sure. So for notes, can you put in um, definition of compostable? Yeah, like the ASTM standard. Yeah, so <clears throat> now I'm going to back pad a little bit. <laughs> because the ASTM standards do allow a small percentage of non-compostable material. Mm -hmm. So for example, some of the granola bars. So there's a there's a big push from industry to mm -hmm. move towards compostable, even though the infrastructure in the United States is not even it's nice. very little is there for that. But um, for example the the very thin metallic lining in a granola bar, mm -hmm. compostable packaging mm -hmm. um, is so small that it's acceptable under ASDM standards as de defined as compostable packaging. So we okay. would probably need more information about that. Right. So maybe we could put right this after is that. Andy, I'll chime in in terms of the con. There is no ASDM standard that I'm aware of that can define compostable in the environment. Um, there are a few states that have created, if you're going to make a compostable claim, reference ASTM standards for compostability, but I'm not aware of any ASTM or any international standard that would equate to how we could ever define it degrading in the environment. But the compostable ASTM standard for compostable that industry is using for producing packaging does exist, and they're using, and that is allowing for a small percentage to be non-compostable. But not in the environment, but just under general. the general standards. Okay. Um, and is it correct to say that a con might be that we lack the um, infrastructure in the state of Vermont to yes. compost, to compost, compostable <laughs> forks, utensils, plates, etc. Potentially more expensive as well. Right. Exactly. Well, State I would also urge at least a note that the yes. evaluation of the life cycle impacts on that. My understanding is that compostable materials and our folks make compostable materials, but the energy and the thickness and the weight of all of those materials are significantly higher than traditional alternatives. So maybe you could add in that note field uh, um, the, the short version, the shorter version of what Andy just said. Is it in LCA right, implications? Full, yeah, yeah, LCA life cycle analysis. LCA um, analysis. analysis. Okay, uh, Jen. Um, I would I would just note that. Um, Vermont conservation voters submitted something very similar to this. Mm -hmm. You know, the intent being that there's a ban on single use food packaging that is not, you know, truly biodegradable, toxic free. Uh -huh. um, and looking at the statute, um, the, you know, the recommendations that this group um, is required to submit. I think there are lots of pros for this one in terms of just reducing the number of single-use products, reducing the environmental impact and the health impacts, um, you know, help uh, improving the management just because yep. the volume would be significantly reduced, diverting these products from landfills and then, you know, 
preventing the contamination of the environment. So I would just note that that's a good, maybe a good way to sort of evaluate these policies is looking yeah. at the statute and the directives. And I think this one hits on all of them. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. So I'll ask you to keep your eye on the, You can keep measuring us against those as we work along. That would be helpful. Thank you. Um, can I just add another con is um, a lack of access to products, mm -hmm. um, lack of access to consumer products in the you know in the in the short term at least if we're looking for um, alternative packaging um, you know manufacturers as as we saw with GMO labeling manufacturers not going to change this just for the state of Vermont so right. it's it's going to take some some time for industry right. to find alternatives that can come into the state right. and I think in general on that point I mean it seems like many things we've talked about that I, I sense groups interested in doing there's a question of how the phase in of mm -hmm. how quickly will the market or solid waste districts or hauls of handlers or land uh, how how quickly can the system adapt even if we're agreeing that we want to go that way. So. So, so this would be a ban on the use of these items, not a ban on disposal of these items. Is that correct? A ban. Yes. Not a disposal ban. So there, there is so one thing there. I'll throw out in terms of a con as well. Um, we had discussion on a similar bill in Maine this year, and, and um, the idea was it was not moved forward. But um, there was a lot of discussion from some of the restaurant owners about if you're going to ban single-use plastic items, if compostables are not available in the marketplace, then you're essentially a forcing essentially forcing folks to potentially go into porcelain and glass and, and back or to, to reusable items. There's a sanitation question there in terms of the sanitation quality for food and whether or not restaurants are able to install dishwashers and staff um, dish cleaning crews and like roadside stands and lobster shacks and those types of things. Okay. So and that might be captured too in a LCA as we looked into the, the full impact of alternatives like reusables. We, the energy using a reusable versus right. a single use. Right. That's right. 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 So, one of the things that we might consider instead of a ban on all plastic utensils, like spools is um, a requirement that a ban on non-recyclable, non-compostable. Because um, although, because we have the infrastructure for the recyclable mm -hmm. materials, and we don't have the infrastructure for the compostable materials. So our example, um, there's a, a lot of food service industry that is using the cups that are compostable and the consumer doesn't have a place to put those cups for composting if they don't know that it's compostable versus recyclable they're more apt to put it into a recycling bin which contaminates the recycling um, stream. stream and it doesn't get composted so the likelihood of a compostable cup getting composted in the state of Vermont is pretty low. The likelihood of a uh, pet cup getting recycled in Vermont is pretty high. Would you be concerned that people would put um, uh, utensils in yeah. recycling stream and yeah. cause havoc? There yes. is no plastic utensil that right. can be recycled. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the size. To think about that part. That that would maybe be a separate, mm -hmm. and I don't, you know. Again, the, the alternative is probably the bamboo. Maybe a note would be, the con. be or or a note that we'd have to um, um, carve out um, somehow um, flatware or silverware. You don't call it silverware, but utensils. Um, yeah, I would put a note that. 
under the cons that would indicate that um, well, the infrastructure you know is already there, but um, this would drive uh, use of compostables versus recyclable uh, serviceware without infrastructure. Yeah, without bolstering the compostable infrastructure right. that's already. Yeah. Okay. And then and that could have an adverse effect on the MRF getting this material. Right, and adversely affecting the recycling stream. And then the note next to that would be the flatware um, is not recyclable in any recyclable at all. Okay, so what was the last one? There we go. Flatware is not recyclable. Flatware not recyclable. Um, so if we were to consider making that ban um, for ban non-recyclable, non-compostable instead of ban on plastic. You're the, you're the author of that recommendation. Do you want to amend it that way or leave it be and add a note? Um, I think a note, a, a, a note could take, could take <coughs> care of that. Um, in, in fact, when I was offering that thought, um, I was thinking the hospitality industry primarily, as as did our as did our previous legislation. Um, be that as it may, exploring it for all single-use plastic bowls and cups and flatware, whether you purchase them in a, in a, in a retail situation or use them in a hospitality situation uh, would be, would be uh, irrelevant. Uh, so that might be something we want to consider actually. Are we just talking hospitality or are we talking every, you know, all, all usages? So what I was thinking about, um, for example, is uh, events that happen on the waterfront, say, in Burlington, right? And if we have a ban on all plastic eating utensils, plates, and bowls, uh, then they can only be made of materials that are compostable. And we do have that infrastructure in that area, but if that infrastructure isn't accepting compostable uh, bowls and cups, then that's going to get uh, landfilled. That's assuming that it's, it's not actually reusable um, utensils, um, and, and and events do do use reusable utensils. Um, they're they're rented, and, and the the event provider provides them, takes them back, and and, and washes them. Through. Industrial washing and stuff, but but I, I, yeah, I, it, we we are running at the risk of, of of drilling really deeply here, from um, where let where in the committee process for legislation would would make a reason to go. I'm just suggesting. Um, So, Jen, and then probably we should go on to the next one. This, I, I don't think we're going to spend this long on every single one in all the pages <laughs> because we're pulling things forward from other pages. But yeah, so let's keep working. On one, that. just one of the comments, uh, or two quick comments. One, I think, just to it, remind folks that I think that the goal and the intent and the statute is to think about how we move away from single-use products, not plastic to compostable because there are challenges with compostable and recyclable single-use products. And so I, I would just, I think that's a good way to kind of think about these recommendations. Is this moving us away from single-use products or is it just 
transitioning us to a different kind of single-use products that might be less bad or may be just as bad in a different way. Um, and then, so I'll just, that, that's just my comment. I think that. I, a reminder that reduce wins out overall, yeah. over and over again. Okay. All right. So um, any other pros, cons, notes on this one? And then we'll go on to oh. I just have one that yeah, tags on to that, and that there's an, a hierarchy, too, of the setting, mm -hmm. and that the fair or the roadside snack shack is, is one setting. Right. But there are also established settings that uh -huh. use single-use uh -huh. products. And so, I mean, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. I think we're moving away from it, but we want to drive that. And I've seen it in schools. I've seen schools uh -huh. that instead of, they've retired their dishwasher, and instead, purchase single-use yeah. flatware and uh -huh. daily for daily uh -huh. use. So, you know, that's a, an established setting where there's, right. it's a low-hanging fruit. Right. The roadside snack stand is, is a different setting altogether. So context matters, right? Okay, great. Um, so, EPR for film plastics. Just film plastics? What's that? Only film plastics. In, in this in this in this column, yes. Um, <laughs> but, Come on, talk. But, it, but but it, it, in the next suggestion, it talks about um, EPR for essentially all plastic and glass containers. Um, uh, so it, that, those could it, good good point in question. Those could those two could be you know merged. And, um, into one uh, single use, including film. This wasn't meant to include agricultural plastic. Well, it was before we got testimony oh. that said <laughs> how that's virtually impossible uh -huh. um, since we submitted those, and, yeah. and and so that that could be a, a, a you know a con don't have the capability of agricultural plastics right mm -hmm. now. Um, yes. So what would your, the, the uh, first, well, we'll work our way through the columns. A pro is, uh, um, well, everyone will have their own idea. I suppose it's a simpler system not to have a bottle bill. It's a, in essence, that's the end of the bottle bill. Yeah, um, th th there are jurisdictions that are, have done that, um, and then the the uh, the EPR coordinator actually takes over um, with with a deposit for all of the containers, and then so it's just, so it's a little bit of a misnomer um, when I say discontinue the bottle redemption. Um, and, and, and brought the wrath down on me <laughs> from several directions, but it's just approaching it in a, in a, in a different way. So you mean, do you mean to integrate it into an EPR system? Yes. A parallel system? Yes. Parallel? Managed by the EPR yeah. system. So it's like, the Van, um, like British Columbia. Yes, exactly. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so discontinue slash integrate. Bottle reduction and replace with EPR for plastic film and glass. Yeah, um, I think that covers it, it much much more eloquently. Would you want it to be an EPR for all um, packaging and printing materials, like we heard about from Quebec and Ontario and BC? Um, I think I would, with your best advice. <laughs> Well, maybe that's the pros and the cons. I mean, yeah. I think when you start teasing out part of the recycling bin, but not all of the recycling bin, mm -hmm. the implementation mm -hmm. might be tricky um, as far as the collection of materials and the management of the materials if you're not ca capturing all of those materials. So currently, the, the fiber, which is 70% of the blue bin, mm -hmm. is costing money to recycle. And that's all the paper products. That's all yeah. the paper and cardboard. Yeah. And the other 30% is the beverage containers and the food containers um, that are generating a revenue. 
mm -hmm. to pay for the system. So if you were to have producers paying for the system and they were the producers of the plastic film and glass, um, well, so glass isn't generating any. Right, right. Sure. glass is, is definitely a, a good candidate, but you're missing a, a good portion of the recycling stream without cardboard. The paper fiber. And, yeah, yeah, paper yeah. fiber to help pay for that system. So putting putting the fiber part in the previous one, um, where, where it says uh, yeah. EPR for plastics, uh, is one the, the, the number one above that? Whoop. I don't know what happened. Sorry. What happened? Uh, I think we combined. So, yeah, we combined. That's what happened. Um, so then, so then, in that last one, we have to add fiber somewhere. Cool. Where would we add the fiber? I think you want to oh, well, you undo that last thing. Yes, thank you. Because a couple things. <laughs> there. Like we could add a new row or we there. could edit. Here we go. This one. Sorry, I got a little. So this was. This was the discontinued bottle this, right? Mm -hmm. So discontinued or integrate, right? Yeah. Um, the bottle redemption. Replacement in EPR. Yeah. For so it's bottle redemption with EPR. Uh, also to include fiber. Uh, Do you want to just say printed materials and packaging? Yeah. Could be brought? Yes. Thank you. Printed materials. I recommend that one. Wait, which comes from the definition of the single so use of products. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not making you up. <laughs> no, it's, like, it's very familiar. Um, so one quick thing in terms of, Jen, you were saying on the food, 70% fiber out of food bins creates a cost. 30% is beverage and food containers create, generate revenue. Out of that 30%, what's the percentage? Yeah, what's the percentage that's glass and now, in essence, contaminated glass and a cost. Twenty percent is twenty. So it's forty. Forty percent of the material going into a MRF is paper and cardboard and fiber. Twenty percent is glass. And Sorry, forty percent is is paper. Yeah. Got it. Twenty percent is glass. Uh huh. Another twenty is plastic, and then the remaining is residue. Okay. When I was and, looking and, at our, so the, yeah. the port, it's closer to 70, yeah, we have it's pretty high. Right. The fibers? Mm -hmm. Going into the MRF, not just into a blue. Okay. Well, I would say the output of the MRF is around what you're marketing for fibers is like of all marketable materials aside from glass. It's, so that's what I'm. That's what I'm discounting is the twenty percent that's glass. Right. Yeah. So we have a kind of a weird contract. So I would get only. And that percentage is by weight. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So for um, pros, um, discontinue any rate bottle bill for, for printed materials and packaging. Um, let's start filling in that column. Um, it would assist with the um, situation we have with our recycling system. Right, with the cost. Through the markets and everything like this. So, definitely assist with the cost. So, the, the stressors you're talking about was one was markets, two was cost. Of running the current system, mm -hmm. we don't want to lose our ability to recycle what we already have, right? Mm -hmm. so, okay, so there's both those pieces. It, and it, can you go ahead? Yeah. Yes. Um, it would also provide an incentive for um, some of the materials to be more recyclable and less um, being disposed because they would be made of materials that can go into the recycling system. 
if there were modulating the Right. Yeah. Depending on the system that gets it done. Okay. Potentially could. A question, I, I don't know if we're getting to this level of detail, but we obviously heard presentations about the British Columbia system, Quebec system, and there's a differing, varying level of control and how an EPR system will be set up. Are we planning to define that now? Because that's going to impact the pros and the cons. Um, as you know, we've never done this in the United States, and it's a pretty expansive yeah. framework to create. Right. So it's definitely something to be worked through in, in some detail. But for laying out our, our table for now, I'd say you know, we could put a note uh, to that effect. But I think we wouldn't. Let's not drill down. Uh, so it's a, a good point, but we should just add a note. That uh, I don't know how you'd summarize that. As in, uh, the model needs to be developed for the United for successful implementation in the U.S. I'm not sure what you would call it. I'm struggling a little bit with this one because this seems like two different recommendations. Uh -huh. We're kind of talking about the pros for an EPR for printed paper and packaging, mm -hmm. but we're not, there's a bottle bill component to it too. And so I see a lot of cons with discontinuing the bottle bill. But there are certainly pros with an EPR mm -hmm. for printed materials and packaging. So I'm just having, these seem like two different things. Well, there's pros for an EPR on bottle bill material too. So do we want to just um, leave it at integrate bottle redemption system with EPR system and focus on that because the recommendation for EPR for printed material and packaging is made numerous times in this report right. and we can tackle that separately. And, and I think what I'm hearing from Jen is um, remove the word discontinue. Yeah. And integrate bottle bill. I mean, I think that I think that there are several recommendations for uh, EPR for printed materials and packaging. Um, and I think the bottle bill, how you deal with that, is sort of a separate issue. Um, you know, or break this out into um, having it be, I think there just needs to be a separate conversation about whether or not there's a you just what are the pros and cons of discontinuing the bottle bill mm -hmm. and then what are the pros and cons of an EPR for materials and packaging because I I'm just cons you know the yeah. bottle bill there's it's a successful recycling program it's working people understand that there's a lot of benefits to it and there's a lot of cons to doing halting that discontinuing that program and doing something totally new for and those materials and their proposals to even expand the bottle bill, right so. Right. The, 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 that's all, all absolutely correct. And this is part of the wrath that got brought down on me with that <laughs> word discontinuum. Um, and yet, the integration of, of um, bottle bill containers, if you will, with all other glass and plastic containers um, in an EPR has has been shown to be very successful. And, and that's, so that, that, that keeps deposits and keeps um, containers clean and, and um, is managed by the, the um, EPR uh, stewardship organization. Stewardship organization. Right, and, and that's really what we're trying to get at is more clean, usable containers that that get remade into other products, and um, that is a, 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 a cleaning of uh, the mayonnaise jar. <laughs> and we always pick on the mayonnaise jar, but that's that's what happens in the stewardship organization. So. And, yeah. Do we know that for sure? In the sense of, of 
is it going to be sorted and collected and, and cleaned? Um, it, that envisions more of a British Columbia type of system where manufacturers control the system and contract um, with. Absolutely. Would those, under an EPR, wouldn't those bottled glass containers still be going to a MRF, whereas under the current bottle bill structure, they're diverted completely? Is so it, can, it can go to a MRF and be kept separately and bailed separately, right. so it's clean stream and managed through the MRF, which this, if the stewards were managing all printed paper and packaging, that would be part of what they would, they would work with the bottle bill to do that, but likely for efficiency purposes. It, I mean, this is just a scenario, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily, mm -hmm. it, it can go to a MRF and be kept clean mm -hmm. and not mixed in with the, the other recyclables. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's, um, in the interest of covering territory we need to cover, let's leave this one. This is your proposal, so we'll leave it that way. Okay. And mm -hmm. Later on, I think we'll encounter other ones that suggest something different, like expand the bottle bill. Um, that brings, um, give me your, your yes. page is next. So I think we just talked about glass. Right. So let's, I can see that one of the tricky things here is when we try to integrate competing things. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we yeah. stick to these yep. pretty discrete categories as mm -hmm. you have right here, we can work our way through them. So we move to hard to recycle plastics or jump uh, right to emergency, of emergent concern. Uh, let's let's put them all in. We said okay. we would we would keep them all. So we'll okay. start with glass. You know, like yeah. what your suggestions are for glass. Um, so I think it's been pretty clear that we would support some type of EPR put on glass. Um, one of the struggles that we've had in kind of coming up with adding more things either to a van or an EPR is that we're struggling handling what we have today that we're collecting and the cost that's incurring. Um, Kathy mentioned it earlier, and so how do we how do we help bolster the current infrastructure that we have in place and keep that sustainable? And you know, once we can get that done, then maybe we can move on to some of these other categories. But we need to fix what we're already collecting today that doesn't have a market, like glass, like three, six, and seven plastics. Okay. So that's why we added those to the list. And um, all right. So in other words, they they don't flow through the the, the uh, glass could the glass we're, we still get bottle bill glass at the MRF even yeah. though there's a bottle bill it, and the it's bottle bill material and even if you expand the bottle bill to include wine bottles we mm -hmm. still get glass because right. products are made in glass. Yeah. So how can we figure out a way? You, you know you can't to ask the consumer to collect glass separately at their house, they're not going to do that. So what, what seems to work with recycling is convenience. So if they put it in one bin and we collect it and then we have a, a, a better infrastructure to help clean up the glass to get it to a market, then somehow the producer could help us do that. All right. So is the pro then that it um, produces a higher quality glass recyclable yes. material. And is there a con? Uh, well, the we con two, is two people, blue bins people, of one? people wouldn't want the bottle bill to, to go away. I mean, there's a system in place um, for the bottle bill, but um, I, you know, I, I think more a con of the, of the bottle bill is that it tends to kind of cherry pick the valuable material away from the blue bin mm -hmm. and doesn't help cover the cost for the MRF to recycle some of these other items. Okay. So another pro then would be uh, creates revenue stream to support uh, mixed class recycling. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, any notes we should add? I would, I think 
the just noting the concern of promoting more mixed mm -hmm. stream recycling in terms of the contamination and other challenges that come with that. I just think that should be noted. And are you envisioning an EPR program for just glass or a fee for a container for glass that goes into a pot that helps pay for the system, which is a little bit different yeah. than just an EPR program? I, I think the container fee. Yeah. Because I'm not sure how EPR would work with just that's, glass. And that's the question I have. Because yeah. what Jen was just saying, I, I was thinking, well, in a true EPR program for glass, the producers determine yeah. how it's going to get collected. They may pull that out of mm -hmm. the breathing system yeah. and collect it right. separately, which is more ideal keep the value. to keep the value. Um, so that is a potential pro. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, right. it all depends on how it's implemented. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So it says EPR with and container fee. So Maybe we'll know it should that it's be slash or. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, hard to recycle plastics. So I think this is pretty straightforward. Yep. Um, not a lot of markets for the three, six, and seven plastics. Um, we'd like to see you know producers put their product in one, two, or five that does have a market. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe this could be where you kind of create some of the demand that we heard about earlier um, to you know incentivize producers to put it put their product in the more recyclable materials versus okay. the ones that don't have a market. Okay, so uh, for a pro would be reduce costs to the MRFs, right? Because you would not have plastics that end up being just a cost <coughs> to handle. Your, that don't you know, have a market. Right, yeah. and reduce um, disposal of products that aren't recycled. Right. Or, uh, material. right. Mm -hmm. Going all the way back to the whole reduce thing. Right. right. Yeah. Um, I think that this yeah. should say EPR hard to recycle plastics. This one. The recommendation is EPR for hard to recycle yeah. plastics. Yeah. You had it on no, there, no. you just didn't have the EPR. <laughs> if you want to undo that, yeah. Just there you go. There we go. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. A lot of pressure. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of pressure. <laughs> 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 it's easier to watch. Why are you all here to do this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, any cons related to? Uh, it could cost manufacturers more to use those other resins. Well, I mean, that could be a con for the LCA also. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a question. I would just put out there, we've seen higher administrative costs with EPR programs as compared to existing systems, and also likely loss of control. If we go to an EPR system, the manufacturers are going to control the PRO and potentially having to contract directly with MERFs and salt waste districts if we follow some of the Canadian models. So, uh, sorry, can you, we're, we're filling in the chart as you're talking, and can you restate that as a con, as a con please? Thank yeah, you. so lots of local control over solid waste, and also higher administrative costs when a PRO is established. Organization. And then obviously increase cost of products. Right. Okay. So maybe manufacturing of products. Great. All right. And making sure we add as a pro also reduce uh, reduce waste to the closely mm -hmm. system. Right. Thank you. Reduce what? Waste. 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 I, I, I'm I might. I might um, challenge uh, loss of local control because the the uh, stewardship plans need to be approved, um, and that approval may actually give us some lock 
of local control, but um, they're, they're, uh, they would, that would happen with the consent <laughs> of, of, of the governed, I guess you would say. Well, I would just point to British Columbia. If we're going to debate pros and cons and not just list them, um, I would point to British Columbia and how that contracting system has evolved. Okay. So maybe next to loss of local controllers, always you could just put in parens, uh, a note just back in the middle there, right? Um, no, whatever. See British, see British Columbia. Great. Um, contaminants of emerging concern. <coughs> Which is pretty, and Kathy added it up to the um, to Jim's packaging. Um, but certainly, this is something that's a concern for us all. Um, and you know, we absolutely need to start going up to the manufacturer of this chemical, not the collection and disposal facilities. So. Um, you know, right now, um, you know, the disposal facilities, which is essentially Casella in Vermont, right. is being tasked with solving this issue, and that's the that's not the appropriate place to be challenging this and solving this problem. Um, so, you know, we need to go to the manufacturers and help them and ask them to figure us out, figure out how to solve this issue. Right. And some of those materials are single-use products, and some, some of them, them are not. Like, it, it would no. be challenging, yeah. for, and you couldn't probably ever get all of them. Right. And then there's certainly some legacy waste out there, too, that mm -hmm. would be impossible to get your arms around. But I think that's why I liked how you added it to the packaging piece, because at least mm -hmm. it kind of singles it out in that, mm -hmm. in that use. And in that, if it's in food packaging, that's probably likely ingested and probably mm -hmm. a more direct intake than and some of the other, you know, furniture and other textiles that are out there. Mm -hmm. So, and I would just add, it's not necessarily just PFAS in some of the right. food packaging. It's yeah. other classes of emerging contaminants. So just yep. wouldn't want us. You want to box I think us it's a really that. important yeah. point, but just yes. it is beyond PFAS. Sure. It's just that what we're focusing yes. on right now, right? right? So I mean, it is contaminants of emerging concern, and yeah. we can't lose sight of that because yeah. there's going to be something else coming down the road next, I'm sure. But um, so it could be reduced ex for a pro, be reduced exposures, mm -hmm. reduced production, and reduced exposures, and contamination to the environment. Mm -hmm. To be faster, just to um, and, and just actually to, to all of them. So see, okay. see, yeah. Yeah. and then. And I think I would add, just to make it explicit, you know, a um, public health benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just cost to the state for cleaning up mm -hmm. PFAS in the environment mm -hmm. as well right. and managing it. The, the cost is astronomical. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah it's yeah. astronomical. Mm -hmm. Cost to the state is a pro. It would a cost. reduce CD. reduce cost, cost to the state for, for cleanup. Yeah. Cleanup. Um, cons. Any uh, <laughs> downside to, to to making this moving in this direction? I don't know if this is a con, but what are the alternatives? Do we know what the alternatives are? Are there alternatives? Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah, so maybe that's a there, are. there are. Yeah. <laughs> there are. Yeah. Question I've got is how, if we're to recommend action, does this conflict with the children's chemicals program that exists at the Department of Health and the authority that they may have to already take action in this area? Okay. So maybe a, a negative would, uh, well, let me let that go up. Uh, council is saying he does not believe that, well, he might as well speak. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> right in. So the Chemicals and High like Concern it. program is a notification program about the presence of the, it. There is authority to ban chemicals under that program. By rule, um, and the rule would need to be consistent with statute. <laughs> so any 
if there was any enactment of statute that would ban the use of that chemical here, I don't, I don't see much of a conflict, um, especially since the chemical, the consumer products definition for the chemicals of high concern to children has significant exemptions, including, I think, food products. I'd have to check on that, but um, I, I, I don't see much of an overlap. Okay. So um, maybe we could move that to notes and just say uh, reconcile with um, <coughs> chemicals of high chemicals concern. Of high concern. Program. Chem chemicals of high concern to children. whose scope is just children. So and I think we're talking about broader than that. Okay. Anything else for this while we're in the I mean we don't have any cons listed. Um, which may be the, <laughs> I really think of one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So then that moves us then to batteries. And yeah. So we just recommend that lithium batteries be added to the current battery stewardship program. Um, we've had a lot of safety issues, fires at recycling facilities and transfer stations with people actually burned to the ground, um, okay. <laughs> uh, caused by lithium batteries. So we like to see them out of the waste stream. Okay. So we need that stream. EPR just to be EPR stewardship, I mean, just to be consistent. Correct, yep. Mm -hmm. Could I add? Um, and lithium battery embedded products because there's numerous products that contain lithium batteries that you can't separate. For example, vaping devices, which are becoming Cards. more and more pre yeah. prevalent, and people are chucking them in their recycling bins, yeah. and those get run over by loaders and create fires. So. Okay. Those are products, not batteries. Okay. So pros would include uh, increased um, safety for recycling mm -hmm. programs, right? yeah. like that. And, so and, and waste disposal waste. facilities. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Jen, you were, but but I think you were saying batteries, uh, um, including embedded. Yeah, yes. lithium battery yes. embedded products. Yeah. Products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to have that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Any downside to doing that? Any notes we should capture while we go by? Well, I, I would say for an EPR program for lithium batteries and battery containing products, your, the cost of the device is going to increase. Okay. That Whether that's a downside or not, it's it, just a fact. It's vaping not. Right. Yeah. Okay. They won't buy. <laughs> I don't care, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just yeah. a scoping yeah. question. Lithium batteries are reusable, correct? They're rechargeable. So, no, they're not really a single use product. So eventually, eventually they do get disposed because they're no longer rechargeable. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out if it's in the scope of what we're charged to do here or not, and we haven't okay. heard from anybody in the industry. And maybe we could refer this to um, a pending bill that is looking at making improvements to our primary battery EPR program, and you know make Maybe a recommendation to that because there. it's it, it's okay. not technically a single-use product but it is a concern that we all have um, and I and I'd add to that um, and we refer to a appropriate refer to an appropriate bill. Mm -hmm. and there is one pending right now yeah mm -hmm. okay I, I, I think we've all been talking about the, the 
danger of of lithium batteries when they get in when they get into the into the um, trash or recycling systems. So I think a note um, could be um, this is a safety issue. Um, so, Jen, are you covering for Vermont Conservation Voters? I can, yeah. I can that. Okay. So, single-use food packaging. I don't know. Well, it's not there. It's a good job. It's a good job. Sorry. 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 Using both sides. I'll be quick. I promise. Sorry about that. Let's see. Here. Blast off. So... These are all pretty standard for VRGA. Um, obviously, our goal would be to avoid increases in consumer prices, but also um, maintain access to products. Um, we understand the issues set forth, um, but we also need to remember that we're not uh, an island, and we have increasing purchasing um, options via the internet. So. We need to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, who's paying for those products to come into the state? How do you track those products coming into the state? Um, both online and out of state purchasing. Okay. Um, I don't know if we, you want me to go through all three of them? Well, yeah, I'm just uh, while we're doing post kind of notes, I don't know if, if I mean, the. the comment speaks for itself. Yeah. I don't know if we need to sort of rough fill, keep on filling in the grid for that one. Unless you want to add something. Nope. Okay. Is that good? Uh, uh, is there anyone want to add any more? Nope, that's fine. Okay. Um, number two, identify opportunities to increase consumer motivation. Um, obviously, we all uh, have a personal responsibility to uh, recycle the products that can be recycled um, and also reduce our Purchasing of non recyclable material. Um, pretty straightforward. And then, number three, um, just establish a stakeholder task force that could serve as an ongoing group of um, stakeholders to, re to review the system and provide guidance um, based on industry experience and. Uh, retail experience and environmental experience, etc. Okay. Can I have us go back to the notes box on Aaron's first one? I was just going to put in complexity of supply chain and tracking. Yes. Mm -hmm. Keep track of that. Thank you. Um, can I? Add a note in the increased consumer motivation to recycle. Is that what you want? Motivation, or do you had in here education, expanding consumer outreach and education. Yeah. Okay. And motivation. So if if that's um, similar to the bottle bill, for example, you know. incentivizing and motivation. Yes. So yeah. my note would be. Um, um, Question on where funding would come from. Okay. Yeah. So I was thinking the same thing. It's like the more, the more that you all do on um, outreach and education, the less we have for infrastructure investments, yeah. for instance. I think we can speak to the numerous stakeholders in the entire system that could help with outreach and education. So, yes, well, okay. Without imposing a fee or a tax? Right, uh, sorry, why were you going on to your third? No, I'm, okay. I'm saying that the stakeholders can help with outreach and education. Oh, oh, oh um, I see. Right. Yeah. Right. It's an all to be a government <laughs> responsibility thing. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. Um, and then I think we're up to your third one. Um, Pro 
probes. So it seems like a pro to me is that it's a uh, complex evolving system mm -hmm. and we need to stay in touch with the whole community. Right. I mean, the markets are always changing, right? I mean, so it would be good to understand what those markets, what markets are working and what mm -hmm. markets aren't. And yeah. and can we make this recommendation more clear because I don't understand what it's saying? So I think that it's similar to this. It's having a conversation, making sure that, similar to the bottle bill, the stakeholder um, meetings, making sure that we all come to the table, make sure that we all understand the impacts on every industry, not just our own industry, and understand that we all are probably going to have to make some concessions at some point to fix the system. Cause, okay, because it said task force of all industry stakeholders and then guidance on departments and agencies and enforcement. So I thought that what you were recommending is an industry formed task force that is advising government on enforcement. No, I would never, I wouldn't anticipate um, okay. industry advising okay. enforcement it, it, situations. It wasn't clear the way it was written. Any more to note on that one? All right. Thank you. Um, so, Jen. Um, so, I we submitted a package right. of recommendations yep. just because you know we think <clears throat> it's critical to attack this problem from a number of different angles, and so. You know, the first is that we should be working towards um, a reduction in the use of um, single-use packaging and products by a date certain. And so that's one, is that let's get on a track to reducing single-use products. Um, and then the second recommendation is a series of bans. We know that some things are more problematic in terms of volume, toxicity, impact to the environment. We should just move forward and get those out of the system completely. Um, and the third recommendation is making sure that manufacturers are bearing the costs um, associated with the products they're producing. So um, EPR programs. Um, and then the third or the, the fourth is an increasing um, uh, a mandate for uh, recyclable content and products. And so I can go into greater detail in, in, yep. in each of these, but just, you know, we felt that this, we sort of needed all of these things right. to be able to really tackle the plastic crisis. And the, the going back to the, um, the reduction of waste, um, from single-use packaging and products, we recommended 75% by 2030. And so this would be a modeled off of um, similar legislation in, in California that basically has a, it's similar to carbon reduction goals, yep. right? We've got a requirement to reduce um, plastic waste and the, you know, ANR is required to promulgate rules right that would get us to that. And the, the benefit of that is that it sets a goal. We all know what we're working towards, but it gives the state and stakeholders time um, to be thoughtful and strategic about how we go about eliminating reliance on these products. Okay. Um, so it will be uh, clarity and uh, increases clarity of uh, a state timeline Mm -hmm. pro. Right. Clarity. Mm -hmm. the exactly. Okay. Okay. Can we go into detail in the other ones or work through? Yeah, let's just put in, you know, um, we're clearly going to run short of time, but that's okay. okay. We have another meeting to keep on working, but. Um, I think if we rough in more things, okay. 
so would the, be helpful. Great. The the bands, I think, focusing on where we know there's um, a major problem and then alternatives, um, you know, that's where we would recommend focusing in. And, and we've talked about it already, but yeah. single-use food packaging and there's some other low-hanging fruit like, you know, hotel, shampoo, bottles, those kinds of things. Um, so it's thinking about where there's opportunity, where we know there's high volume or increased toxicity um, and getting those out of the system. Okay. And then for EPR, I think that we, you know, would focus on really two components. One is um, expanding and modernizing the bottle bill uh, to cover certain types of water bottles, wine bottles, hard cider, sports drinks, and juices, and increase the deposit from five to 10 cents. Mm -hmm. And then the second component of the EPR recommendations is packaging. And I think we've started to talk about that with other recommendations. Um, And I think that you know we we've provided some um, sort of high level guidance on what we would want to see in an EPR program from packaging. We've we've talked a little bit about that already today, but you know thinking about how we would uh, create a system that would have um, eco modulated fee rates based on the level of recyclability, the amount of toxicity in the products. Um, And then I think, you know, we've... So let's put that in a note, right? Like a, a modulated um, schedule. Yeah. yeah, and I would just note that there's two components. It's the bottle bill, expanding the bottle bill, and then an EPR for packaging. Do you have any thoughts on um, the fiber? Um, or is packaging part of that? I think that we would. The I think that we we would look at packaging as being expansive and include that printed materials. Yeah, printed materials and packaging. Yeah. I did look at our numbers, and they are seventy six percent fiber coming out of our list. Coming out. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and then, and, and you know, consider yep. pros for these is that we would um, reduce the amount of waste being disposed, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that we really tried to tag these recommendations to the statutory mm -hmm. charge, and mm -hmm. so I think that all of these recommendations would um, would you know would hit those requirements in terms of reducing the use of single-use products, reducing their environmental and public health impact, improving statewide management, diverting single-use products mm -hmm. um, from disposal and landfills, and just the preventing contamination um, in the natural environment. Um, so maybe at a, a shorthand in the pros column, it um, meets all statutory criteria. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I think because we really tried to stick to what was in the statute. Would that be for all of all first? Right. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And should we cite? I mean, you're talking about um, this year's act. Right. Well, so yeah. So I wonder if we should cite that. I mean, as as. Act yeah. 769. Yeah. yeah, and section three, the directive to the working group is to make recommendations based on these criteria. Yes, so Act 69. Mm -hmm. I think that's important to put there. And then your last item, should that be recycled content? Yes. Oh, yeah. This one. Mm -hmm. well, recycled oh. content. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's how, what they put into making that item, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, gotcha. Okay. 
Okay. So, um, Jen, when we're back, I'm, I'm moving back up to your ban mm -hmm. um, item. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you failed to mention today um, the packaged water ban for, for um, state and municipal purchases. No, I think we would still include that. I just, there's a lot of detail that I didn't go through. Well, yeah, but. I wanted to spare everyone knowing that we're like, okay. close I, to four. I didn't want to spare us okay. <laughs> that bullet yep. as part of, of, of the Oh, so we would still recommend ban. that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would just say the exception is where there's um, uh, public water supply contamination. Yeah. And we need to or supply. Disaster. Or, or disaster. disaster. Or disaster, or disaster, or disaster, or disaster. Whatever, yeah. where we need yeah. to supply. Although yeah. there are challenges with that because we now have PFAS contaminated bottled water um, that is circulating because, of, rents, the, yeah. because yeah. of the lax stand, you know, mm -hmm. regulatory standards. But yes, I think that is a, this is where you're seeing two, like, Challenges. Yeah, that's line. a good place in the notes to yeah. make to make mm -hmm. a note. Yeah. Yeah. Um, emerging emergency situations. Uh, well, that's because you've mandated if there if a water system is contaminated, the law oh, yeah. said you have to provide oh, yeah. bottled water. Don't, so don't, you don't. Can't know. Yeah. Well, I yeah. don't think the law requires them to provide bottled yeah. water. Yeah, it, has it, to it be does. Potable. Right, they have to provide an alternative source of potable water. Yeah. yeah. Which it's usually comes from. from. <coughs> if you yeah. look at the other jurisdictions <laughs> that have done it, they build in an emergency yeah. condition or, or yeah. authorization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm looking and trying to see if we can get to a halfway point. Can people stay like till 10, 15 past, or do people have hard stops? Stay. I hate to ask. Well, okay. So, um, great. So we've roughed out what you had in that section. Any more notes or discussion? And then I thought, we well, if we could do one more, then that puts us in a pretty fast. Well, then maybe we'll do two more. All right. Am I up? Yes, please. Thank so, you. That's why his chair. Right. So <laughs> under mine, I listed um, options. And um, the first two are kind of like either or, and so um, extended producer responsibility for uh, packaging and, and printed materials. I think we already have up there, so we don't need it again, right? Right. 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 Work goes in um, and I think our preference would be for that rather than a fee. But you know, we had we had included both in case there was more appetite for a fee than an EPR program. Okay, so I don't know that we listed a fee version of this. Maybe we should. We could list it as an option. Right. Yeah. Right. So there would be a, a fee on all printed materials um, and, and packaging. The, what the con is there is that um, there's no manufacturer control. There's no manufacturer incentive to do anything differently um, because of that fee system. Um, Which they um, would just pass on to the... Cost of the product. Right. Um, and implementation could be challenging because who's going to, you know, do you have a stewardship organization collect the fee or is that mm -hmm. on the state? It gets, it's more complicated, I think, Cross than an EPR program. And, and then, and and then the, how do you divvy up the fees that are collected mm -hmm. amongst all the different players that, you know, uh, collect? transport and manage these materials. Right. So it, it would be super challenging. Yeah. That. There's something in it that it, you have more cons than pros. For the <laughs> 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 but yeah, you know, I was just trying to like be uh, transparent. Yeah. Here are all the options. <laughs> okay. um, would, be, would it be a, a, an alternative to EPR? Would Correct. it be a pro or a no? Or a sure. Note. It ties them together too. Yeah. Funding for recycling system is a pro. Yep, that could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's why you suggested it. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the harder to manage materials, I think, have been talked about because glass and, mm -hmm. and, and the other materials that are not easily recyclable. So I'm not sure if we need to talk more about that. Um, you know, I think the committee has discussed in the past, you know, what do we do with glass? Do we, do we 
have it separate in an EPR? Do you keep it in the EPR program or do we move it more into the bottle bill? I mean, I think those options are all on the table with the, with the things that we've listed. Sure, we'll be discussing them further. Yes. <laughs> right. right. I don't know. If we're, gonna, we're not going to solve that problem today. No. Right. Um, bans from sales. I think we covered that one as well. Um, and then the, the post-consumer recycled content, I think that was the last item uh, mm -hmm. that Jen mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and that different states right now are considering legislation. I don't know if anyone has really passed anything, but they're, you know, they're using mm -hmm. dates out there, you know, 2025, 2030, with different percent recycled content for different types of materials. Um, I, I don't know if we want to go it alone on that one. I think we want to look at what other states are doing. Right. So, was one of the cons for that the availability of the, the, the material? material? Right, that's yeah. been mentioned before. Uh -huh. that, like, oh, that would with, have been. With certain. Um, PPT, nope. For example. Go down. It's the last thing Jen mentioned. This? No. Uh, no. This one. Using mandate yeah. for yeah. recycled mm -hmm. content. So, there, there's a questionable um, availability of recycled of material for. Use yeah. Use right. This content. is our chicken and egg discussion. Right. Yeah. If you build the mandate, you create right. the market, or if you don't have the market, you have the requirement. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Some states are considering garbage bags because there's there's so many of them. Use <laughs> if we just did recycled content <laughs> for garbage bags alone, that would increase. Hmm. Yeah, you know, the, the recycled content that goes into the garbage bag, not recycling the garbage bag. It looks a lot like black plastic ag film. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's what you can do with your ag film. There we go. Yeah. There. Okay. That's it. Is All that right. quick? That's uh, really award winning. So yeah. we're gonna we can keep going. Who would want to stop now? Uh, <laughs> is that a question for the table? No, I sure it's a rhetorical question. Um, Jen. Um, so what I have basically proposed is what's already been talked about as well, which is um, EPR for, for some of these products um, using eco-modulated fee structure yep. that addresses environmental recycling, recycled content, et cetera, um, and also looking into recycled content requirements for certain products. So that's done. Okay. Um, is Stephanie on the phone? Well, sorry, I don't mean to jump ahead, <laughs> but now that I see it, we're so I'm picking up the pace. Yes, no. So I, 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 I'm questioning just just oh, to be yeah. sure yeah. where the the mod. I, I want to have modulation in here because we've all, well, many of us have yeah. talked about that. I just want to make sure that you know, we can have it in. Oh, we right have it there. as a note. Yeah. Yeah. That's a note, yeah, and and I think it may be, uh, for Jen's purposes, it needs to be standalone. Also standalone, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So Jen, would you agree with with, with that? Yeah. 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 So ego. Please. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Incentives, maybe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I think I'm going to get serenaded. <laughs> Holy. <laughs> I think so. All right. I'm sorry we're not having that kind of excitement at this point. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll I'm not sure they're not looking at this. They'll be rolling it on. Are we adjourned? All right. So eco-modulated incentives, uh, I think um, it's like incentives and disincentives. To reduce, right? Incentive to reduce environmental impacts yeah. is the benefit. Yeah. Um, and public health impacts. Right. Um, like all the, the criteria. Cons, yeah. it's, it's complex. It's complex complicated. It's yeah. it's hard yep. you know, Con, it's to know what you know. If you're looking at LCA, that's mm -hmm. really um, it's hard just to collect. Yeah, yeah. it's just the information. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 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 Hard, hard to impart to establish the criteria. 
and collect information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Ready? Anything more? Good eagle eye there. Not letting us drift off the page. <laughs> And also highlighting what um, Aaron had said earlier, the, produ the producer is also being responsible for providing, you know, education as well. Mm -hmm. That was a note on the other thing, but um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. So producers involved in what was it? Education, like helping with education instead of it all being carried out by government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, plenty of effort goes into marketing and branding, um, and including environmental aspects. When when there's something that a producer wants to tell, they oh, are very good, good at oh, yeah. Yeah. letting us know that it's there. They have experts too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stephanie, are you on the phone still? There's a limit to a phone endurance. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> she was earlier. You're right. It's harder to be uh, at a meeting. Hours. Oh, I think you had to phone. Um, so I'm flipping the page and I'm seeing Jen, you're on uh, my version. You have more. To yeah, so I submitted this after um, folks had submitted and I saw a lot of input on the bottle bill. And yep. my intention of this was after an EPR system was implemented, which wasn't really clear here. Okay. Um, but I think for the most part, this has been talked about. Okay. I don't need to continue. To right. Okay. Uh, Andy. Is Andy still with us? Right. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> so we are up to your um, set of recommendations. Very good. Well, I appreciate that. Um, so obviously with the first one, um, there's been a little bit of mention about what is our goal, and the area that I've been able to get some consensus in is striving towards recyclability. And if certain products aren't able to meet recyclability goals, there would be other compliance options, but this is something that's evolved in the California legislation that continues to be considered that the idea is striving to reach a recyclability goal EPR is a financing mechanism, but it's not necessarily tied to any particular goal that we're going to reach greater recyclability and, and greater recycling of the product. It's, it's a financing mechanism. Um, so I wanted to suggest that we identify a clear goal and what is that going to be and, and then what are the, the procedures or what are the, the mechanisms around that that we need to, to have in place to help reach whatever our ultimate goal is here and again suggesting recyclability is the aspect that manufacturers have the greatest amount of control over uh, and have the greatest ability to influence within their supply chain okay so for uh pros then we end up with uh you know what clarity for all stakeholders and uh if you were to assign some any downsides to this? Um, were you just saying in, in terms of local control versus uh, EPR, producer consortium control? Was that one of your concerns before? And no, I, I, this I think is more about, it's less about what system is going to be implemented and how we get there, but it, it establishes for manufacturers a clear direction that we, the state views, and again, this is coming out of discussions that have happened in California and other places, the state views recyclability as a goal that is going to be sought after and achieved, and if manufacturers aren't, if that suggested the goal has been articulated in California, 100% recyclability by 2030, if manufacturers are not able to reach that goal, then they would have to potentially establish other compliance mechanisms. Okay. In the current draft of the California legislation, that could include EPR, but it doesn't have to. Uh, and it could also include post-consumer content as a way of reaching that goal. 
uh, as an offset uh, or potentially other alternative compliance programs. Okay. Uh, again, for some packaging types, it might be a store drop-off program that is, is their best outcome. You heard a little bit about the RAP program today. That potentially, if manufacturers sought to utilize that as their way to reach 100% recyclability by 2030, is, is a mechanism that could reach this goal of 100% recyclability. Okay. So it sounds like another pro then might be um, flexible means for achieving goal. Is that what you're saying? In yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that would definitely be a pro is if we establish that as a goal, then we could subsequent to that determine what manufacturers and different industry sectors might choose as options to reach that goal. Okay. It's like voluntary, voluntary EPR for manufacturer, uh -huh. incentivize voluntary EPR. Except they're not paying for the recycling. All they are is making the material recyclable. Voluntarily. So, well, if they're, if they're not able to, to reach recyclability, then they would have to potentially look to pay. Okay. So, so I, can we, on, the, on the con on that, it yeah. doesn't address the cost of our recycling system. It also doesn't address the volume problem. It doesn't right. reduce the volume of reduction. waste, right? It's a recycling. Right. You're changing, you know, you're changing the terms. composition, but you're not reducing the volume. I think another, another con, although the con could be, I'll just say this first, another con could be is it's only addressing recycling. It's not addressing um, reuse, um, reduce, or even remanufacture in a, in a circular kind of economy, which um, we've had some testimony about circular economy and the need to. So if, we, if, if we're just focusing on recycling, um, we're missing, we're missing a, a, a large bite or multiple bites out of the apple. Um, and then perhaps I should have put that in the, the California goal is 100% recyclability, reusability, or compostability in their goal. So I, I should have provided greater detail to that, but that's that's part of achieving the goal. Yeah, I would want to see that in there, and, 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 and Jen, I think you've got another word that goes in there as well. Um, <laughs> um, reduction. Reduce. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'm not sure how you mandate reduction in, well, you're not even, man, it's a goal. It's a goal for recyclability, re reusability, or compostability, I think is what Andy said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I and reuse would be a form of source reduction to, to some extent, if that's what the, 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 the desire is. Well, yes, in the circular economy, you're actually reusing mm -hmm. this material. Um, so and, yeah. I would have an um, additional con as uh, doesn't take into account uh, other environmental impacts, so LCA. So just because it's recyclable or compostable, perhaps the non-recyclable material is preferable for the environment overall just because at the end it gets landfilled it may have protected the product better or it was lighter weight and had less of an environmental impact it was like the coffee packaging yeah discussion right so recyclability Jen, i'd love to see that in kind of all the recommendations obviously that we've talked about thus far okay. um for the notes um andy can you seem to know this number can you give us the california bill member on that? Uh, yes, yeah, Senate Bill 54, Assembly Bill 1080. It's a different Four, paradigm. It's a very Christmas gift. Okay. Christmas gift. Great. All right. Um, consumer education on contamination, unless there's more comments on that one. Um, well, I just have one. That yeah, it's come. a note um, about. Uh, definition of recycling. Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, nice. um, making sure that, you know, with that, there would be a definition. Because if everything moved to glass packaging because it's right. recyclable, then we'd be 
creating new problems. Well, the other thing is too that there's these different types of recycling, like chemical recycling, mm -hmm. right? Right. Which yeah, and waste of energy. Yeah. Right. Which right. some people view as recycling, right. and some people some don't. don't. Right. <laughs> so it's yes. making establishing <laughs> yeah. those guidelines yeah. to, for that kind of uh, requirement. But I, I think that. Yeah. yeah, and I would agree. We we need to define those issues, and as we need to define all those issues and all the other solutions. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're not picking on you. We're just, we're <laughs> just, just clarifying. <laughs> um, so your next one was consumer education on contamination. Yeah, uh, and the reason for this, obviously, um, we all know that, that contamination is a major issue. We've seen several presentations, you know, alluding to the fact that the contamination of the stream is part of the big problem and some of the solutions nip at trying to either move things into the bottle bill to remove contamination, et cetera. Um, I think one of the challenges for manufacturers is we don't control consumer behavior. No matter how much we try to educate, uh, move to the how to recycle label, all the different options that manufacturers have available to them to <clears throat> move towards trying to educate consumers, that's one one aspect that I think we all, at least I think, could agree on, that there is there is uh, lack of full understanding of recycling and how to reduce contamination for, for most consumers. And there needs to be a concerted, concerted effort to try to educate consumers. Washington State has had a, a pretty aggressive program um, and has done some benchmarking on, on the impact that their programs are having, so um, I think it's something that, that should be considered uh, and, and obviously is, is something that we think could help move the dial um, a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, one thing that occurs to me is not very often have I seen instructions on the product I'm buying about its how to handle it and it has the groups you're working with, have they talked about, um, you know, one ex one exception to that is when I've bought in toner cartridges and they provide, you know, they tell you, here's a label, mail this, mail the empty back to us and the thing. So it's a complete transaction all in one. I get to recycle when I buy the new one. Um, do you know if the groups you're working with are thinking about producers helping on that education so that we avoid contamination issue? Yes, yeah, so I mentioned the How to Recycle uh, label, which is run by the Sustainable Packaging Coalition. Okay. Um, that I, I, I can't cite you the exact date that that program started, but there's been wide, I think, acceptance that that's the direction industry is going to move to, to move to those types of labels, as well as trying to get, make sure that there's alignment between How to Recycle and the Association of Plastic Recyclers. So there is, and I think you will increasingly be seeing those labels uh, on on packages uh, directing consumers whether or not it, it's it's considered accessible. So the ones and twos generally would be considered bin type recyclable. Others, again, because of the local control issues, you may have to check locally. And then uh, for others, it might be a store drop off or return to manufacturer type of option. Um, to your, your toner example, you know, the products that have a ship back to me option tend to be higher margin products yep. uh, or those products that are light enough that we're, you know, not going to be putting bales and bales of material into the mail to go back. Okay, great. Qu question on, on, on this, Andy, w was your intent that um, it would be manufacturers, consumer education on contamination or the state of Vermont or some sort of a joint program? I think it would need to be collaborative because obviously the manufacturers don't know the diversity of the solid waste system in Vermont. So I, I think there would need to be a back and forth. But um, I, 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 I do think that there's both sides of responsibility in the equation. Uh, so I, I think we need to capture that somehow. Right. Um, maybe in the notes section, uh, education result of uh, manufacturer and and municipal, if you will, or state program. Yeah, you know, it's called education. Yeah. Okay. And the recycling and waste industry. 
Mm -hmm. right. yeah. 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 Manufacturers recently. Yeah. Re there we yeah. go. Yeah. There we go. Manufacturers. <laughs> <laughs> state. There we go. Yeah. Municipalities or solid waste management entities. Yeah. A joint effort. Yep. See stakeholders. Great. Uh, so say so. All right. And Andy, you get to close out today. Number three. Okay, um, somewhat self-explanatory, but um, in, in our discussions and in my evaluation of Vermont, you guys have, or Vermont has one of the most extensive uh, waste laws in the country with the universal uh, waste law, et cetera, um, and obviously anti-littering statutes. I, I think we all continue to, to be frustrated with the fact that consumers might still litter products or improperly use the, the solid waste system, um, my question or suggestion would be to understand how more active enforcement, um, we've seen things through the recycling partnership where there is, it, well, I wouldn't say voluntary, but there's efforts to tag non-compliant recycled bins and reduce contamination and create, in essence, a better recycling ecosystem through enforcement and and um, combine them somewhat with education, but, but through enforcement activities. So uh, to the extent there are existing statutes on the books that, that I, I think are pretty exemplary, exemplary for other states in Vermont, um, understanding how greater enforcement could be helpful. Sure. Did you share with us, uh, was it your um, Atlanta doing sort of people were getting their recycled uh, their toters uh, sort of analyzed and tagged if they were contaminate putting in contaminating stuff or maybe I just saw it in the in the avalanche of information we've gotten. <laughs> yeah I think that was Dylan uh, from the recycling partnership that presented a, a couple of meetings ago that had some information on that so yeah thinking something like that. Okay. Um, I just um, I think one of the things to note, though, is that um, because of all the programs that we do have, you know, we have 72% recovery of our blue bin items, uh, the mandated recyclables, which is pretty high, especially compared to other state programs. You know, we can go out there and, um, you know, beat people with sticks to recycle more, but that doesn't really address the issues that we have with the cost of our recycling system, the stresses on a recycling system, the reduction, the reduction of it. I mean, I think Vermonters are doing a pretty good job. Um, yeah. There is always room for improvement, and we can do more to enforce the laws that we have. I think that would make a very small, and maybe this is a con, it would only change the amount of material going into our recycling system uh, by a small fraction and does not address the issues with our recycling system. And it really is a hitting something at downstream yeah. with with the people that have the least control over the system. Yeah. I mean, consumers have the least control over what manufacturers are producing and sending out into the world. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that these are really downstream mm -hmm. and putting the burden on people that have very little control. Yeah, but we are creating policy solutions and recommendations to deal with things like litter, which is very much a consumer activity that I think, you know, is, is, a, is a problem we're trying to address and discuss, correct? Well, and the, and the quality of the material, though, what those materials are that do get littered. And I think Jen's point is that we don't have any choice in what those people are, are purchasing because that's, that's what they, those things come in. Uh, any other notes or pros, cons? Well, that, that pro, you can't see, but I'll tell you, the pros field is empty on this one, so we, <laughs> we need you to um, encourage us to think more about active enforcement. But so what's your um, how, pro for that strategy? Would that would level the playing field more for, like, good actors, bad actors, you know, because those that are going to... It's Not. pretty level for residential yeah. recycling. Nobody gets any, you know, it's like you put stuff in a recycling bin, whether it's contamination or not, and everybody's treated the same. 
So, is in terms of pros, in, in my mind, re reduction of littering, cleaner streams, and more easily to manage um, materials coming through the system. Less contamination. Less contamination. Okay. Less contamination. Than is. <laughs> Great. All right. So, any other um, comments on this last item for today? Yes. I think it's only appropriate Andy should be the cleanup hitter. He's done a great job. <laughs> right. Well, great. So um, thanks, Andy. Thanks, everyone. Um, and well, for right. staying. Oh, well, we have that. This really was with four. <laughs> and I figure okay. that way we, John and I here, plus Stephanie and um, the rest. Right. John, <laughs> Stephanie. I need to go. And did we, was there one other? There was. I think there was. I don't know if we had to go that. All right. Anyway, yeah. so it's a much lighter uh, flow. We'll do those first and then uh, wrap up uh, next session. Next week. The report, yeah. um, if you could just say one more. You know, so we have this. Right. Um, so people may want to look through this. And what we're collecting now is going to go into the appendix. In here. Uh, into appendix B or C or something right. so? Yeah. Would it be a, I don't know if you want us to kind of <coughs> wordsmith that a little bit. Oh yeah, I don't want to get some at all. I was typing <laughs> right. with, with what I heard from four different directions. Yeah. I'd love to send this out to the group. Mm -hmm. And then and if anyone has any back. Back. right. Okay. Yeah, send me back. All right. So questions. thank you everyone. And so right, this is our first mm -hmm. capture at it and We'll tune up what we need. There's probably some things we can consolidate distill it, um, and uh, distill it down a little bit. Um, we're getting pretty close to a, uh, an annotated list. And so we'll finish that next meeting, and then that will flow into the appendix and the report. Um, so I would ask people to just read everything else that we already have. Uh, to look for edits, comments, etc., that we can discuss next meeting as well, which is in a week. Next week. Week from today? Yeah, one, one week from today. Here, same time, same channel, same place. Same, same room. Okay. That's all we got. Okay. <laughs> it's all we got. Let's go outside. Right. Okay. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, for staying and uh, getting us this far along in one day. Oh, we're good. <laughs> yeah. We're off the record.